Now be recorded. Good morning, Carroll County. This is uh, Commissioner Ed Rothstein, and it is Thursday, February 25th, the last open session for February of 2021. Can you believe we're going into uh, into March? And uh, looking like the snow is going to be behind us. It's beautiful blue sky, getting up to about 50 degrees today. So life is good, as I like to say. Um, what I like to do, as we always do, is start with uh, Pledge of Allegiance and then take a uh, moment of silence and reflection of all those uh, that are still being, um, you know, dealing with the uh, COVID and the pandemic, giving strength and courage to them and also to our frontline workers. With that, let's stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I don't know about you, but I love that pledge. <laughs> um, what I'd like to do is, uh, before we individually get into our priorities for Carroll County in uh, opening the session, <clears throat> I'd like to recognize a couple of folks. Uh, the first is uh, if Ed Singer and Lee, if you can uh, come up. And uh, Lee is going to be leaving us uh, in Carroll County in the health department after 30 plus years of service to our community. So. Uh, from me to you, Lee, thank you so much. And uh, with that, Ed, if you want to say a few words before Commissioner Frazier shares in the proclamation. Sure. I'll, I'll share that. Uh, and, and Lee, you can go ahead and leave your video on so people. Oh, yeah, there you are. Um, I, I just want to share. I, I've known Lee since uh, since the day he started working here. And uh, I know when we uh, when, when he originally came here, his intention was this was going to be a uh, a short-term job for him and uh, he wound up sticking around a, a lot of years. Um, one thing I'll say about Lee is he really uh, enjoyed when he was working in the field, helping people individually to, to resolve whatever issues they had. And, and one of the things I think when the, the previous board of commissioners appointed me as health officer, they were a little concerned about was, uh, you know, the environmental health had a, had a tendency at one point in time in my career to be considered to be a little bit heavy handed with regulation and whatnot. And uh, we've, we've got an important job to do in protecting the public health, and we've always been focused on that. But uh, the one thing that Lee's done, and, and, and I appreciate it, is uh, really emphasized uh, the, the importance of trying to protect public health, but also trying to help businesses and homeowners and individuals um, figure out a way to meet the requirements in, in, our, in our regulatory requirements and, and, uh, and to protect public health while still being able to accomplish uh, what they want to accomplish. So it's that kind of customer service that that uh, that he's done a uh, a wonderful job with. And uh, Andrea Hanley, who's going to be the new um, environmental health director, is on here with us today. And I just wanted to take the opportunity to introduce her as well while we say goodbye to Lee and and, and welcome Andrea. Uh, but uh, I, I, you know, I'm hoping hoping that this will be a, a very seamless transition. Andrea has been with us quite a while um, as well. Uh, actually, she started before Lee, <laughs> so, uh, but uh, Lee's done a great job in, in ensuring that we're providing outstanding services to customers and, and citizens in Carroll County, and that we're meeting their needs while still protecting the overall health of the community uh, with our Environmental Health Bureau. And I'll, I'll stop there, Commissioner, and turn it back to you guys. No, thank you so much. And uh, Lee, if you can, uh, or if you would like, share a few words. Yeah, it, it's been a privilege to serve here in, in every capacity. I'd like Ed said, I started in 90 and I was a field inspector, I guess in 95, I became supervisor for our development plan review and just um, have enjoyed each phase of my career here in the last five or so years in this role. I kind of took with a little trepidation, but I found that I enjoyed it a, a lot and um, especially working with our leadership team and and just um, all the people that we've interacted with, our interactions with you, I've enjoyed those. Um, and like Ed said, my, my kind of my biggest um, pleasure here has been helping people kind of brainstorm and come up with solutions wherever possible. And so it's been, um, it's been really enjoyable to do all of that. And I, I appreciate the opportunity to have served this way. 
Now, Lee, thank you. And the leaders lead and lead again through selfless service that I think you've provided to uh, to our community. So thank you so much. With that, I'd like to uh, read the proclamation. Do you like to read? Oh, I thought he said, do you like to read? I was about to hand it over to you. It's great. But that's to okay. It. I appreciate you letting me do this again, Commissioner. <laughs> I'm here for you. <laughs> Lee Broadwick, in recognition of his career and retirement, Lee began his employment with Carroll County Health Department on February 21st, 1990. We are honored to celebrate his career of outstanding services to the citizens of Carroll County for over 31 years. Lee consistently provided outstanding customer service and instilled a philosophy of trying to meet the needs of community members and businesses by finding a way to accommodate what a permit applicant wanted while protecting the community from any potential adverse public health outcomes. And Lee worked cooperative, cooperatively with many Carroll County government departments in developing processes which were more efficient and best served our mutual clients. And during the COVID-19 pandemic, Lee was not assigned to a regular role at the Health Department Emergency Operations Center, but relied on heavily to assist with operations of the Health Department. He resourced staff to support the COVID-19 response by ensuring that the Health Department critical activities continued being provided. Lee served as president of the Environmental Health Directors Conference and led the group in handling legislation, legislative and statewide policy matters, which impacted health which impacted public health by ensuring laws, regulations, and policies best met the needs of Carroll County citizens. Lee nu nurtured a delegate program, a grant program, it's getting tough, for best available technology for on-site sewage disposal systems in addition to being involved in assessing water and, and wastewater problem areas. Now, therefore, we, the Board of Carroll, Carroll County Commissioners, recognize Lee's outstanding leadership and contributions keeping Carroll County citizens healthy and wish him many years of good health and happiness and hereby proclaim, pro, proclaim March 1st, 2021 is Lee Broderick Day. I'll hold this up to the camera. You can see it because I know you don't have it. And there are you, you go, are you okay there reading that? Yeah. I, I mean, it, it seemed like it, uh, it was tough. Sure. It was tough. Does anyone... Uh, and my fellow commissioners have anything they want to share at this point. Lee, I just want to say thank you for 31 years of service to Carroll County. And as a side note, Ed, when we uh, appointed you as health officer, we had many concerns, not just about the environmental health. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes you got to scrape the bottom of the barrel, commissioners. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's, I had concerns myself. <laughs> commissioner thank Weaver? you so much. Yeah. I just want to say thank you. Uh, I've had many citizens have problems or reached out to you. You went out, you solved their problems or helped them solve it, worked through it. And uh, uh, for them, I say thank you. For me, I say thank you. And Andrea, you have big shoes to fill, so good luck. And uh, you won't be under Ed's heavy-handed tactics, I guess, uh, in environmental health. So. Commissioner Boucher. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Mr. Roger, I thought the most enjoyable aspect of your job was working with Ed Singer, but I guess I was wrong on that. <laughs> well, I think everyone in that department's going to miss you, and I know that you get a personal sense of satisfaction doing what you've done throughout your career. And as you retire, I hope you get to enjoy your grandchildren if you have any, spend time with family, maybe do some traveling. But since you enjoy helping others, you know, most likely you'll probably get involved in some volunteer work to fill your, your time up and uh, satisfy that void, which I think will take place when you do leave your employment work for the county, because obviously you have a passion for what you do. And I hope any volunteerism you do in the future can help satisfy that. So thank you very much for your service to the county. Thank, thank you very much. much. Commissioner Wentz. So Lee, good morning. Good morning. Uh, you and I have a little bit of a history. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, we've gone round and round a lot. Uh, when I was uh, president of the fire association, there were a lot of questions as pertains to fire departments and and uh, the things that were going on on carnival grounds, et cetera. And uh, we haven't always disagreed or all, we, we haven't always agreed on everything. Uh, you did your best to try to explain the code to me, which I still don't get. Uh, but maybe Andrea will help me with that at some point as well. Uh, but you handled it with grace and dignity. And that's what's important. So for all of those times that you and I have disagreed, uh, I thank you uh, for your service to the county and for being uh, very professional uh, with, with the questions and the, 
challenges uh, that, that we've seen over the years. So my best to you. Uh, it, your, your job certainly wasn't easy, and uh, <laughs> it, um, it, it's always been very complicated, but um, I, I appreciate your, your service as well as everyone else does too, and I wish you Godspeed. Uh, with retirement. I tried that for about six months one time and it was pretty good. Uh, so, so good luck in wherever life, life takes you. And, and again, thank you for, for all that you've done for, for Carol. And, uh, see, and, and the bottom line is you don't have to argue with me anymore, Lee. So that's the best thing that you could get out of this retirement. So there you go. <laughs> Congratulations. No, thank you. Hey, Lee, as they say in the Navy, bravo, Zulu, job well done. Andrea, welcome, uh, you know, to I'm the new Andrea, look at the camera no, a second. No, no, no. That. What's that? Andrea, just, we're, we're sharing because of technical difficulties. No problem. Just welcome to the new role. And uh, Lee, thank you again for all that you've done. So um, thank you. that's thank all. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks. What I'd like mm -hmm. to do now is uh, talk about a transition it is not a time to uh, formally recognize uh, a departure uh, because that will also come with a roast, which I'm expecting to see. But I'd like to say thank you to Tom Devilbess and uh, mm -hmm. announce the acting director that's going to be taking the stormwater management role of Chris Hine. So, Chris, uh, I'd like to say you have uh, big shoes to fill, but uh, Tom is a relatively small gentleman, so I think his <laughs> shoes are not as big. Uh, you're coming with a, a significant, um, you know, uh, level of uh, expertise and experience. Uh, so I look forward to that in this transition between you and Tom upon his, uh, until his departure um, is gonna be time really well spent. So, uh, you know, welcome into that new acting role. And just want to say, you know, again, Tom, thank you for all you're doing. Um, mentoring me and others using for me small words for me to understand and uh you know being persistent in getting things done the right way so i think that's the uh the the, the key role or word i would use <laughs> is that persistence in doing what's right um but if my colleagues would like to uh say something and either welcoming chris or having a pre roast of uh, mr devilbus have at it so um that's, I think it's too early for that. I think it is. Yeah. To but, roast, uh, but yeah. Chris, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to disagree with my colleague. You have a huge uh, set of shoes to fill. And uh, I, I think that you will do very well in your acting role. And uh, we, it's, it's, a, it's a great advantage to have this month or so uh, for Tom to be able to give you a little bit more uh, mentorship down there uh, because it's a big department and there's a lot going on. So uh, we look forward to what you bring to the table as our acting director there. Thank you for stepping up and taking that position. Commissioner Boucher. Thank you, sir. You know, Mr. Hine, thank you very much for coming on board and filling this position. I was a little bit concerned that you might not want to take on this responsibility. And you know how much I love your department. You guys take me hiking out in the woods. We see wildlife. I love the environment. And it's heartwarming to know that you guys are on the front line protecting our environment. Because if we're not proactive with this now, then we're going to lose in the future. So I'm sure you don't be calling Tom a lot on the phone to answer some questions when you're in difficult situations. Or look, he's giving me that look. I think he's going to turn his phone off. But you're in good hands. And I'm sure Tom's always going to be there for you when you need him. And best of luck. And whatever you have any projects out there in the woods and, and streams or whatever, get in touch with me. I'm more than happy to be out there and get out of the office. So thank you very much and best of luck to you. I see okay. Chris, thank you for stepping up. I appreciate it. Take full advantage of this time you have to work with Tom in the transition because uh, I have to say Tom has, there was never a question I asked that he didn't have an answer to. So take advantage of his experience and his knowledge and I'm sure you'll, you'll do a fantastic job. Thank you, Chris. I just want to say, Chris, you have the confidence of the Board of Commissioners uh, going in behind you, going into this. So uh, you're doing fine. I just want to know what happens to the rock collection? <laughs> okay. Again, just want to, uh, to, to formally recognize uh, Chris as the acting director and uh, saying thank you 
for, again, like others have said, stepping up and uh, as Commissioner Weaver shared, having the full confidence of the board in moving forward. So with that, um, if there's something you'd like to share, well, Chris? I just wanted to, yes, thank you. I just wanted to thank you all for the vote of confidence. And uh, as you've mentioned, Tom has a, a wealth of knowledge and, and decades of experience that we'll be very sorry to see that go, but um, I'm happy to step in and I will do my best for you all. So thank you. Fantastic. And Tom, you're not allowed to talk right now because we, we have plenty of time to roast you at a later time. So, okay, let's move on to uh, Priority Carroll. I love being able to do that. Let's start with uh, Commissioner Wance, and we're going to go down the, down the line. District 1. District number one. There's a reason it's number one, right, Weaver? Anyway, uh, good morning, everybody. <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, it's good to see everybody. No, you know I yeah, I know. You know what amazes me? Uh, we, had all that, we had all that snow on the ground. We had about, I don't know, almost 10, 11, 12 inches on the ground. Almost all of it's gone in a lot of places. Isn't it amazing <laughs> how strong the sun is? So, uh, you know, as it begins to blossom here into spring i hope everybody takes advantage of uh getting outside this will help also with our covid uh situation as well as we as we can maybe get back outside i feel like a, i've never been on this side of the of the, of the dais over here so i'm a little <laughs> bit out of sync today uh and i also because of the camera, yeah yeah i know because of the camera angle i almost look like a little kid in a high chair <laughs> Which, which that is true which, which that's always yeah, okay, is, whatever is let me phone book. see i open the door let me get all in. So let me get you a phone book to sit on yeah okay so uh, we're gonna work on that throughout the morning swam and i are gonna work on that uh, but it but it actually might be legitimate because uh i'm we're expecting a new granddaughter here within the next week or so so uh maybe i should get used to seeing in in the high chair type thing here um congratulations yeah That's thank right. you i appreciate that uh in about well any any time now within the next week or two so uh families families growing so that's a wonderful thing uh one one really other quick thing uh as we continue to see the recovery i hope and we're phasing back in which is kind of what we're doing here today uh we've got plexiglass in between us here and we're just we're trying to get things worked out where we're phasing back into some sort of normalcy here uh, one thing that I want to mention, mention, there's a new restaurant coming to Westminster, uh, Mission Barbecue. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mission Barbecue has always been uh, a great friend to uh, all public safety. And uh, they have already reached out. And I want to thank my colleague, uh, Commissioner Ed Rothstein, who uh, put me in touch with um, the owners of that uh, great uh, establishment. And they have uh, partnered with us in one of the golf tournaments that I'm involved with. And what they will bring to our community uh, up there at 140 uh, Village Shopping Center is amazing. So uh, we welcome them. I think they have a soft opening coming up in about three weeks, three or four weeks, March the 20 something. Mm -hmm. So uh, good product, good people. And we look forward to that. And that's another good sign of recovery as we move uh hopefully into uh, a good place as we move further into COVID. Well, with that said, I'll let your guard down, folks. Got to keep wearing the masks, as I said before we got on the air. You know, these things are starting to really become a fashion statement. So, uh, and a lot of people should wear them all the time. I'll let that go. I was going to throw that over towards Emory Road, but I'm going to let it go. And uh, Mission Barbecue, by the way, is also awesome food. Yeah, oh yeah. So there's that. <laughs> so, Besides all the support there, awesome. So, so thank you, Commissioner Rostein. Good morning, everybody. Absolutely. And uh, I will try to not go down like this or like this. And anyway. Are you done? I'm, I'm done. done. Okay. <laughs> District two. Commissioner Weaver. Uh, okay. Uh, you know, District two should be have part of District one if they redistrict properly, but we're not going to go there now. Um, I was at the Board of Ed workshop meeting uh, last night and um, just some interesting concerns. They are, and I'm not gonna steal uh, Ed Singer's thunder here lately, but he did a great presentation of our rate. We're about 60, 60.5, I believe, and it needs to go down to 
uh, to be in the rate they need to open schools it needs to drop another, I think, 10 uh, percent or so for the positivity rate. And um, that is coming, we hope, if it continues the way it's going. But they have some really con uh, major concerns here. Uh, but yet they're reaching out to parents to see if they open schools, how many students will actually be back? Presently, uh, elementary has 56% attendance. I think middle school is 44 and 34% attendance in high schools. If that continues, they'll have plenty of room uh, as students uh, would come back for that four day uh, type thing. But uh, what concerns me even more is uh, the vacancies they presently have. I think there's 23 current teacher vacancies, 62 uh, instructional aides, um, and the last uh, pool, I think they said there was five qualified applicants and um, and student support, uh, 98 vacancies and plant facilities, I think was 18 vacancies. Uh, that's kind of uh, interesting to see what they do. They have a month to put this together, but their plans being submitted to the Maryland State Department of Education for approval or rejection. So, um, you know, they, they're they put the plan together. It's up to the uh, state of Maryland to approve it or not and see where they go. So uh, uh, that'll be the determining factor, I think, for anything that happens for March, I think March 15th for elementary schools and the 22nd for middle and high schools. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Commissioner Weaver. Commissioner Frazier. Thank you. Uh, first thing I'd like to say is fashion statements I'm wearing a wrestling tie today <laughs> and I have my Gerstel mask all that's to say that Gerstel wrestling is having their first try meet of the year Saturday there's uh it was a kind of opt-in year because everything's strange with COVID and uh so there's three B conference schools so we're all wrestling at the same time on this Saturday at Gerstel Academy hopefully uh there might be an independent state schools tournament uh, in middle of March, that's not a co completely uh, settled on yet, but I'm hoping that they're they are looking in that direction. So I'd like to have a tournament at the end of the year. One other note about wrestling: a gentleman I coached the last three years for his senior year moved down to Tennessee because of COVID. Um, they just finished their state tournament in Tennessee, and Greg Mechpack took third in the state. So congratulations, Greg! Nice job. I want to follow up on a couple of things Commissioner Weaver said about the Board of Ed meeting last night. There's a couple of things I in their plan that bother me. Number one, we're in the orange zone right now, as Commissioner Weaver did allude to. That so our a number per one uh, number of cases per 100 is a little too high right now to go back um, <laughs> to school. You know, full time with all the kids. And the the term that they're using in their plan is social distancing at six feet to the greatest extent possible. That term is only going to be used if we drop down to the, to the next lower level, which hopefully we will do, but we're not there yet. Although one of the board members, Mr. Bigley said that we will be down here before we go back to back into to, uh, to school with, with four days a week. I'm going to give her a call right after the meeting to find out what my first of stock tips, because if she knows where numbers are going, I would like to have that information because I'd like to make a few extra dollars being a commissioner. They don't pay enough. Um, <laughs> What they're banking this reopening on or going back four days a week is the number of students that will be actually coming to school. They're, bank they're hoping that less than 50%, 50% or less will be in the elementary and middle school and about 35% will be in the high schools. That way they can keep social distancing, which would be great if they can. But if more kids than that show up, what's the plan? The plan is social distancing at least six feet to the greatest extent possible. That's not really a plan. So I, I, the plan bothers me. They're going through it forward with it. They're sending it to the state, and the state ultimately has to say yes or no. We'll see where it goes. I'm, ho I'm very hopeful that by the time this gets enacted, whenever it is, that our transmission rate is low enough that we can have all those students back to school. But I'd like to be that low first. That, that's just my feeling of it. And that's all I have. Thank you very much. Okay. Appreciate it, Commissioner Frazier. Commissioner Boucher. Good morning, colleagues. With the sunshine and the weather warming up and the, the infection rates dropping, I think it's put everyone, not only us, but out there in the public in a much better mood. And I'll start out here with the Career Technology Center gave out 
two tool awards that I sponsored during my term in office to both a welder. This is uh, Tyler Salick, the Applied Mechanical Engineering, that, that is machining trades. I offered scholarships to the school and they determined the best thing for a young tradesman is tools. So this young man was the recipient of the award for his tools to get his career started. And I believe the second person here is Jacob Staub in welding. And he has his tools and it's so important for these young men and women that get involved in the trades. And I emphasize women because we're seeing more and more young ladies get involved in the trades that when they leave the schools, one of the first hurdles they have to overcome is getting their money together to buy the tools to get started in their trade. So this scholarship, which I've been funding throughout my term, helps these young men and women get their tools together to go into the workforce. I think it's an absolutely wonderful program we have out there. I'd like to thank Dr. Eccles and the entire Board of Education for the expansion of that facility. I think having a thriving career technology center is a foundation which brings a lot of corporations into our county to do business. They want to have a good skilled workforce, and that's a very intricate part of attracting that business and tax base to our community. So I'm wishing both Tyler and Jacob the best in their careers. And also I went out on Saturday to the Ebenezer, Ebenezer United Methodist Church in Winfield off Woodbine Road for their food drive. This is their crew. What a wonderful bunch of people. I, I made a donation to them. I stopped in and seen what they have going on. They have the cars pull up. They load the cars up. And these people are so enthusiastic. You can see the love in their heart that they're helping out their community. And this is just a small example of what takes place throughout our county. We have dozens and dozens of these food pantries that are nonprofit based around their churches. And they're doing a wonderful service to our community, especially right now with the pandemic. There's a lot of people that are suffering from uh, food insecurity, I think it's called. And they're just one piece and the many other churches and nonprofits around the county helping out our citizens. So God bless these individuals, and it was an honor to do the tour. Commissioner Boucher, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and you're absolutely right. There is still the challenges with uh, the food insecurity across our communities. Um, those that wanting to help, like you said, the uh, churches, the religious facilities, the um, uh, service clubs like the Lions Club and others are all participating. Um, and there's plenty of ways to contribute uh, your time and efforts in uh, supporting our community. So I really appreciate that and also highlighting the uh, career in tech um, as, as you've done. And it's, that's great stuff. <clears throat> what I'd like to share without coughing is I read a couple articles this morning regarding the flu season. And February is supposed to be the highest part of the uh, flu season, but they're not seeing a lot of the flu. And they're contributing that because of washing our hands, safe distancing, and wearing the masks. So there is these effects of the due diligence that we have in our community by wearing these masks and doing what's right and and with uh, with that minimizing the impact of uh, the flu. So, uh, you know, right now I think that's anecdotal and uh, with the expectations that there will be some facts afterwards on uh, the impact of all this dealing with the flu. The last thing I just want to share is as I continue to get, as we continue to get phone calls and uh, emails and texts on different situations happening in the community, I believe we are very responsive to you, uh, the community, and that's leadership. This has nothing to do with politics. It has to do with being a community servant and uh, has to do with leadership, and I believe we are all committed in doing that. So I just wanted to share that because I'm getting some some uh, emails and appreciation when we're responsive to those emails or phone calls. And I just uh, asked for the community to continue to reach out to us uh, and we will be responsive. I don't want to talk collectively, collectively for all of us, but I believe that is the sentiment that we, uh, that we bring to the table, uh, focused on leadership and uh, focused on community, not the politics that are surrounding some of the situations. Speaking of uh, some of those politics, um, are there any additional state directives that we've heard of from either MACO or our legislation? I don't think so. Yeah. I'm looking to the two that represent us on MACO. Yeah, yeah we did. Uh, 
this a good segue because we did hear from, and I can't remember where he was from, the health officer yesterday, Dennis. Ed, um, yeah, I don't remember who he was from either. Ed will know. Larry, yeah. I want to say Porter, maybe. I don't Larry Porter from uh, Calvert County. There you go. Yeah. So uh, it was interesting because we had a presentation by Steve Shu yep. mm -hmm. uh, yesterday, which was very well done. We got a lot of statistics yesterday on the, the vaccine, but you know, the, the problem remains that the emphasis, uh, and Ed, you know this, we all know it now, mm -hmm. the emphasis is still on these mass vaccination sites, and that's taking the vaccines away from the local health departments. And specifically, uh, they were talking yesterday uh, about how great it would be if the physicians could get involved more because they best know their, their patients. And because of the mass vaccination sites and the uncertainty of signing up for them yeah. is, it is, is ridiculous. Right. It, it's, it's just, so uh, it was sort of a, we got the presentation from Steve Shu and his folks, and uh, let me be clear, they're doing a great job, but we disagree in many aspects of that. But after that presentation, <laughs> then we had the, the counter opinion, I guess, from, from, uh, from Larry, from Larry, yeah. And, and uh, man, did he hit home on a lot yeah. of issues. Yeah, he Everybody's did. Everybody's trying very, to. Very well, well. I just, I still don't understand why we continue. And listen, well, I, hearing the folks that are having the problem signing up at M&T Bank, and it's, it's a nightmare. How great would it be if we could yeah. do it here? We know our citizens best. Exactly. So I know it's frustrating. I know we can sit here and talk about it all day and probably not going to change. Right. Uh, but, and yeah. Steve, after his presentation, was asked the same question basically three times, a little differently each time. And the question was, why don't you just give majority of the vaccines to the health departments in each county? They best know how to serve their, their people, how to get them out to the underserved populations, how to get to, to the, the people that really need the vaccines. Why don't we just do it that way? And, and that question was asked three different or four different ways. Right. And, and I, I realize how hard his job is, and I'm sure he gets that question every single day. <laughs> and he did a good job try, trying to answer the question. But what they're banking on is that very soon we'll have a lot more vaccinate, uh, vaccines coming into the state. That's what they're banking on, but right now we don't have it. Yeah, that was his pretty classic answer throughout right. all the right. questions right. was, well, there's help coming. Right, right. And wait, well, you're, wait a little while, we'll have so right. many more vaccines. Well, so, I, I hope no, that's true. I, no, I, I appreciate it. And, and yeah. for, again, that this discussion is not for us. It's for you. It's for the community. Right. So to put it in context, Steve Shu is a former delegate, former county executive in Anne Arundel County, and he is now uh, has been selected by Governor Hogan for over a year now uh, to run the COVID-19 uh, task force and to be all COVID on operations and kind of uh, facilitate operations for our state administration. With that, he works with very closely with Acting Secretary uh, Schrader, who is the health department and, and his folks. <clears throat> Every week where we have a meetings with uh, the Maryland Association of Counties where Commissioner Frazier and Commissioner uh, Wance uh, attend. I attend um, every week a, um, a phone call, a 30 minute phone call with uh, Mr. Shu and Secretary Schrader and a whole host of others uh, to talk about these uh, issues. Um, so <clears throat> that's kind of putting it in context where we're at. Uh, and we all, I think, talk to the gentleman who's gonna get on the screen in just a second. And that's Mr. Ed Singer, who has been um, selfless in everything he has been doing in reaching out to our community. Um, and uh, with that, Ed, I'd like you to get on and share with us uh, where we're at with, uh, you know, both COVID-19, the vaccinations, and what uh, expectations we should have over the next few weeks. So, Ed. Good morning, commissioners. I'm just going to go ahead and uh, sometimes I have a few comments before I roll right into my presentation, but I'm just going to go ahead and uh, I think roll with the presentation this morning because a lot of uh, what I want to talk about is is uh, right in the uh, in, in the slides that I'll be sharing with you. Okay. All right. Um, 
let's start with uh, just some of the data. I know uh, that um, that the uh, the commissioner Fraser had uh, had shared with you um, that uh, one of that we're kind of in a uh, in a in a high uh, transmission. Uh, well, actually, we've gone from high transmission, which is the red zone, to substantial transmission. Uh, which is kind of the, the, the area that's in the orange by, by CDC metrics. Now, the, the only problem with that is, um, you know, if you look at, a, if, if you look at our week of uh, February the 14th, um, the, the CDC metrics, the way they're calculated, only include those confirmed PCR cases, and almost half of our cases that, that we know are positive for COVID are, are, are rapid tests that were done. We had about a, hundred, a little over 100 cases that were PCR confirmed, but about 80 more cases that were not confirmed with a PCR that were done by rapid tests. So we're actually in a, what's considered, we've gone from a high rate of transmission to what's considered to be a substantial rate of transmission by, uh, by CDC metrics. And, you know, the thing that I'd point out to you is if you look back, you know, this is, uh, we're, we're still at a higher point than we were uh, in late October and early November. And, and we're, we've still got the spread. I, I, I'm hopeful that, and, and I, I know I always hear Commissioner Rothstein tell me that uh, hope's not a plan, but you, you know you, you can't predict where the numbers are going to go for certain, and we may see some some more blips on the screen, peaks and valleys, but uh, we've gotten over that big holiday hump. We're getting more people vaccinated. Um, springtime is when more people do activities outside, so, you know, we, we can all hope that the uh, – that the trend keeps in a downward in a downward manner, but we're not at, we're not in a great spot right now. We still have a substantial rate of transmission in Carroll County. We still need to stick to what we're doing to try to um, reduce our transmission rates. And uh, you know we're 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 looking to continue to see this trend move the way that it is. And, and you know more than anybody else, I I I want to get back to the life as normal and and. Uh, and be able to take a breath and, and and move on from this. It's it's going to be a few more months, though. I think, you know, as we've talked about this over the last several months, I've told you that I would expect that maybe by summertime or fall, we, we're going to get back to as close to normal as we can. It's, it's you know, as, as vaccines more uh, readily available and, and we, we knock these transmission rates down. So that's kind of where I see things, where we are and where we're going with the uh, with the cases. As you can see, our 14-day rolling average certainly shows that that same downward trend. And the only thing uh, I'll mention on this slide here, and I mentioned it on the Board of Education meeting last night, our our, our cases in in uh, the uh, youth that are under the age of 18, they've they've always been relatively very very low throughout most of this pandemic, where uh, and we were seeing less than five cases a. a a week and, and people under the age 18 until we got into uh, the October time frame and and um, you know, since October we've we've seen this kind of align with uh, where the trends are going in all the other age categories and, and a significant uh, greater number of cases in in, uh, in in people under the age of 18. Hospitalizations by week, uh, the hospital I'll say that they're able to take a little bit of a breath right now too. Um, the, the most recent information that the uh, hospital president shared with me is they've got about 15 people or so that are being treated for COVID in, in their, uh, in the, in the hospital. I think, um, you know, there's really, we never really set a baseline for this, but I, I kind of keep looking at where we were at the beginning of the pandemic and, you know, the highest we reached were, were cases in the twenties that were, were being treated in the hospital. And I'm happy to see that that we're down at least below that, and and hopefully we'll continue to see a downward trend there too. Um, this is our overall hospitalizations and and uh, deaths by age group. And the the one thing that we don't have real good news on yet is is uh, we're still continuing to see fatalities from COVID, uh, both in facilities and in the community. Uh, so far this week, that's not even on the chart. Uh, we had uh, had three additional deaths last week. And uh, so far this week, we have uh, two uh, additional facility deaths and one more community death. So they tend to lag the cases. Um, most of the time, I think we're, we're seeing when people die from COVID, it's probably, you know, somewhere in the range of three to five weeks after they've uh, contracted the, the, 
the disease. So as we're uh, as we're getting into uh, lower numbers of uh, people testing positive and, and a number of positive cases, hopefully we'll see this uh, rate of deaths require um, decline as well. Um, this is an important piece that I want to share with you today, and this is our our. This is a new chart that I've added. Um, it's our Ag Center testing data. And what I want to draw your attention to is if you look at where we are right now, um, our demand for testing is, is down to the point where it was when we first kicked off uh, testing up at the Ag Center. And we were trying to ramp things up. And, you know, we, we started with uh, making 50 tests a day available when we were testing there. And, and we gradually... Um, Made, made more more and more slots available and during the peak of the uh, of the uh, pandemic as far as the numbers are concerned we were seeing we, we had a capacity to test 250 people per day at, at the testing site the uh, the numbers have dropped off dramatically today we've only got 10 people scheduled to come to a uh, to, to the mass testing site I think part of the reason is is that testing is available. Um, not only through us, but also through the um, through the urgent cares and some of the private pharmacies. And um, because our numbers are so low, I believe we're, we're going to look at, and, and, I, and I want your input, I'm going to stop here when I'm done talking about this and just see if you have any concerns, but we're looking at moving to testing on Sunday and Thursday rather than Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday. It, it's just not efficient to run a mass testing site if you've only got 10 or 15 people showing up to be tested and, and the numbers are just uh, dropping off the table right now. We will have the ability that if, if, if suddenly, you know, we had 50 people a day showing up, we can certainly go back to doing Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday testing. It's just that it's, it's, a, it's a lot of effort and all to stand up a testing site for a day. And if, we, if we're not getting at least 40 or 50 people in to be, be tested, it's not a lot of sense to run it uh, three days a week. So we're looking to scale back, uh, possibly be beginning as early as next week, uh, the Sunday and Thursday. So I'm going to stop there and uh, give you guys the opportunity that if you have any concerns about that or if you've got any questions about that, that you can go ahead and ask. And then we'll move on with my presentation. Ed, I believe uh, applying resources where it makes sense. So... Uh... Yeah, I 100% I agree with you. I got tested as I shared, uh, you know, when, you know, we were quarantined. I got tested over at CVS, one with a rapid and one with the uh, PCR, whatever you call it, the long term. And I was able to get uh, tested within a day uh, of my request. I think they're out there. Um, so, yeah, if it's pulling your resources where they could be used somewhere else to serve, I'm I think it's a very smart move, but that's my two cents. Commissioner Weaver? Yeah, and uh, I see the school systems also looking to put a testing system in for their uh, employees and students. So if they have any symptoms, they go immediately for a test, uh, and uh, that'll cut down probably your testing also at the Ag Center. So uh, I think it's probably a smart move in your behalf. And, and I was going to cover that. It's, uh, it, you jumped ahead of me just a, uh, a bit, Commissioner, and I'm going to cover that right after we're done talking about this. Anybody else regarding this? Well, I think it's a good idea to, to cut down on testing at your site because, as uh, Commissioner Rothstein said, um, you can almost go anywhere and get a test now. I had actually got a test a couple of weeks ago. I went online that day, got a test that day, the rapid test, and with 20 minutes I was told I was cleared, and then they took the other test and sent that away. Yep. So you can get a test so many different places. I don't think it's necessary to have it open three days a week at the Ag Center right now. Okay, any, anyone yeah, else? I, th I think communications can be very important as we transition, and I'm sure that's going to be out there. But, uh, yeah, I think it's a smart move. Um, I agree. Any, no, hearing nothing else, uh, Ed, please continue. And, and the important thing to realize, Commissioners, is if we were to hit another peak, um, as long as we're – I'm not looking to totally shut the site down – and, and, and I, I don't think uh, the state wants me to do that. They, they, they want us to continue to make sure that uh, testing is accessible. If we cut back to two days a week, and as long as we still have the relationship with the Ag Center and we've kind of got things in place, I can always put more resources towards it and ramp it back up. So I, that, that's where we're going to be headed, and I'm glad you guys are comfortable with it. Um, hey, the, the thing that Commissioner hey, – yes? Ed, just a quick question. 
what two days were you going to do? Did you say Sunday and Thursday? Sunday and Thursday. And it's kind of funny. I, I, uh, I told the staff, I said, so um, let's, let's go to doing uh, Monday and Thursday or, or Tuesday and Friday. And they're like, nope, we like Sundays. And I was like, why do okay. you like, I was trying to give them the weekend off. And they said, no, they want to stick with Sunday. Okay. Well, that's why I asked, because I know that the Ag Center has been trying to get more events scheduled up there and they're doing a great job. They've got really tremendous best practices in place up there, especially in the Shipley arena. They've got a counter that, that actually shows how many people are in and out the door. Yep. So my only, my, my only suggestion would be that's fine. Working with them, maybe they, it would be nice if we could get away from that Sunday, if we could at some point to allow them to maybe start to phase in a little bit more activity because a lot of the things that they do are on the weekend. So that, that was my only suggestion there. Okay. Well, let, I'll, I'll talk to uh, Richard Brace who's running this site for us and, and uh, have him talk to the staff that are working with him and see if we could uh, take a look at that. Uh, the one thing I will mention with the Ag Center and, and I've got a, uh, we're having some discussions. Some of these uh, seated performances are still restricted by the, uh, the state orders. Um, there, there's a lot of things they can do, but there's certain things uh, uh, that, that we're going to have to talk about the, with them, such as uh, they're going to do a tractor pool. I'm not sure that they're going to be able to do that. It's 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 it, we got to look at how those orders apply and 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 things of that nature. So we're we're in the middle of reviewing some some situations with them. We've been trying to make sure that they're compliant with all the orders and, and whatnot that are in place, but. Uh, We'll take a look at those dates as well and, and try to see how we can best work that for them. Thanks. Okay. So on to the, uh, the, the testing that commissioner um, Weaver had referenced with the school system. Um, the, the governor offered a few weeks ago to make uh, testing supplies available to the schools. Um, I don't know if you all, if we've discussed this before or not, but essentially the health department is the uh, medical oversight. Dr. Taylor is the uh, medical director for the school system when it comes to uh, anything that would require a doctor's order. So we're working very closely with the school system to try to figure out how we would staff. Um, essentially we're looking at regional sites. What we talked about conceptually to start with was, was possibly having testing sites at each of the high schools because it's, it's not practical for us to put testing sites in each of the schools throughout the county. There's just staffing would be impossible. The, the school nurses have enough on their plate. They just couldn't do this. So we, we talked about looking for agency uh, nurses and, and, and uh, regionalizing test sites and having the feeder schools potentially uh, come to each of the high schools. Now, one of the things we were concerned about was not having to have people track into the building who were sick. So, so the school system's looking at options such as potentially uh, using empty portables or something like that to have as the, uh, the testing site. But the, the concept is, is anytime somebody's sick and might have COVID, um, that the parent has to come and pick them up from school anyway. So we could do a consent form, ask the parent to take them to wherever that regional testing site is, that whether it be at the high schools, so, somewhere that's going to be local, they would, this would solve the problem of them needing to get an appointment or do anything else. And, and they'd be able to just go there and they would do a rapid test and, and they'd send off a PCR test. This will help us in, in trying to keep down the number of kids that are in quarantine because they've been exposed to somebody that has symptoms or is suspected of having COVID. And also if, if the, if the person doesn't, the staff member or the uh, student doesn't actually have COVID will be uh, helpful in, in getting them back to school in a more timely manner and being able to clear them from uh, from isolation and, and be able to uh, return to school. We haven't worked out all the details yet, but we're working very closely with the superintendent and, and his staff and, and Dr. Taylor and, and uh, Philippa Gomes, who's uh, oversees all the, all the nurses in the schools and Carl Streaker to, uh, to figure out exactly what this would look like and make this resource available to parents. I really think it would make things a lot more convenient for, for the parents of uh, students and for the staff just to have this uh, test essentially testing on demand available regionally throughout our school system. So that's what that's what that's intended to look like. And, uh, you know, we're, we're hoping to roll that out in the early part of March. Okay. So getting, uh, getting back to our pyramid that we talk, we, we always talk about, I always throw this in there. We're still kind of in the one B. Well, we're still firmly in the one B category. 
with what we're doing with our vaccinations right now. And I know I've got a lot of frustrated 65 to 74 year olds who, who we're not, we're not vaccinating yet that, uh, that, that, that are a little bit frustrated with us at the health department because they've been on our list for a long period of time. And we just haven't had enough vaccine to vaccinate all the people who are over 75 and at much more risk. And, you know, you got to draw the line somewhere. And as Maggie Coons, my, uh, PIO puts it, this was a really bad year to be 74 if you wanted to get vaccinated because, uh, <laughs> You know, we are we are focusing on the 75 plus, and, and you know, I get people that call me every day saying, "Well, my birthday's in six months. Can I get a?" And, and you got to draw the line somewhere. And we're trying to be as fair about this as we can, and we 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 appreciate people's patience. And I'm going to talk a little bit as we get into these slides about where I think we are and where we might be going. So, as I mentioned, we're we're mainly doing uh, 1A and 1B right now. Um, and I'm, I'm going to go ahead at this point on this slide and talk a little bit about the registration system's been a nightmare for us. It was given to us by the state. They're not using it at their mass vaccination sites because they figured out that it didn't work really well for them. And, and uh, so they, they're going to a different system. But it's it's that's only going to be for the mass vaccination sites. We're still going to be using prep mod. However, we've really been pushing the state to, to make enhancements to the registration system. And... One of the problems we've had is, um, is is using these links, and I've talked about people sharing links, and there are a lot of good-hearted people out in the community that want to help uh, some of the elderly folks get registered. And, and, and in some of our sign-up sheets, I've got uh, 200 people who are signed up that are over 75, all with the same email address because some friend from a church group or something signed them up, and it's very confusing to them right now when they receive a link as to who we're vaccinating, who this is offered for. And, and uh, you know, we try to make it clear in the email that goes out, but they're never sure whether it's specifically for Commissioner Wentz or for Commissioner Weaver. Um, the state's supposed to be rolling out a new enhancement uh, that's supposed to start tomorrow, where we're going to be able to upload a, a, uh, a list of names and email addresses and send out a link that's specifically for that person. And it'll come out and it'll say, Commissioner Weaver, you're being uh, invited to register for a, for a vaccine for through uh, Farrell County Health Department Clinic on this date and this time, and click on this link and, and, and you can sign up. That link will only work once. So if Commissioner Weaver sends it to Commissioner Boucher and Boucher beats him to signing up, Weaver's not going to be able to uh, sign up for the clinic. So um, it's going to be very helpful to us in trying to reach those those uh, people that we're targeting in our clinics, and it'll help, um, I guess, eliminate some of the frustration we have with people who are trying to sign up for clinics that they're not eligible for because this is going to specifically target an email address and a person's name, and it's going to be good once, and, and, and uh, they can sign up for the clinic, and we can get them registered and you know, I've said a number of times that uh, when people come to the clinics, they've been very happy with ha how well things are run there. You know, I've had no control over this registration system, and this has been the, the big point of frustration for citizens in our county, and hopefully these uh, enhancements are going to help make this, uh, this better and less frustrating for people. It's not going to make them get vaccinated any quicker, so if they're frustrated because they're 65 and Ed Singer won't go on the uh, – vaccinate 65 year olds until he gets done to 75 year olds. Um, it's not going to help with that, but it will help with uh, the problems we've had with registration. <laughs> so this is our, our graph on the vaccine rollout. Um, we've, we've, uh, we're, we're essentially getting a, a thousand doses a week now, and we're, we're getting projections four weeks out, which is helpful. It's helped us in our planning. And if you'll notice, if you're looking at some of these, uh, the green the green thing is how, how much we're allocated for each week. And you'll see in a couple places where the blue bar exceeds the green bar. And what's happening there is now that I know that I'm getting 1,000 doses per week, they generally show up on a Monday or a Tuesday. I can actually use them the same week that I'm receiving them. So I'm, I'm, I'm forward, uh, I guess I'm forward fronting some of this vaccine without taking a risk that we're not going to have vaccines show up and have to cancel a clinic. Um, for instance, this week, what I did was I told the school system, I'm going to give you, uh, I, I promised them a certain percentage of our doses every week. So for, for the next three weeks, I knew I was going to give them 150 doses, plus I owed them 50 doses from last week. So 
we took all those uh, doses that we're going to give them over the next three weeks, and we vaccinated uh, 500 people over at Winters Mill, uh, 500 teachers and other educational staff over at Winters Mill, and that means they won't get doses for the next two weeks, but we've uh, been able to get some of the teachers vaccinated sooner and get that vaccine out essentially the, the, uh, within, a, within a day of receiving it as opposed to uh, waiting six or seven days till we, we can actually get a clinic scheduled. So we're putting a little bit of that up front now and uh, we're, we're doing a really good job. Uh, last week when I looked at the chart, we were at 104% uh, of our first doses administered and that was because um, you know we are getting a little bit of extra out of some of the vials. So our, um, our staff are just doing a great job in, in getting people vaccinated. Um, this is the uh, <laughs> this is where I want to talk about our plan, where we are, what we're doing, who we've vaccinated, and what we think we've got left. So we'll start with our, our plan, and and well, I guess I want to start with where we are. The um, we we've got about uh, we we've we've vaccinated about almost uh, 4,600 people in the education sector, and that includes private schools, daycares, and Carroll County public schools. Um, I think we're pretty much done with the demand that we had in, in Group 1A, which is the healthcare providers and first responders. Uh, we're not getting a lot of demand from those folks to sign up for additional clinics. I offered a clinic last Monday that was for, for um, for private schools and daycare providers and, and 1A, and the clinic did not fill up, so we opened it up to uh, the public schools. I, I had that separate set aside for public schools for, for vaccine, but this was specifically for daycare providers, private schools, and, and, for, uh, and, and for people who would be in group 1A, and that clinic didn't fill up, so we're, we're not planning on having a, a, another clinic for that targeted population in the very near future, although some people reached out to me after the uh, clinic was over and said, oh, we need a, uh, we, we've got more people we need to be vaccinated. So I do have a small list that we, we may work on at some point in the future, but we've hit most of the majority of our um, 1A, our private schools and our, and our daycares. And with the public school systems, we've gotten, I, I think we're probably at about 60 to 70% uh, of, uh, of, of the, uh, public schools um, folks that we've reached. We, we've got uh, about 1,700 left from uh, the information that, that I talked to Carl Streaker about. About 1,700 left that still want to be vaccinated that are in the public school system. And maybe some of them will get vaccinated somewhere else and maybe they'll get vaccinated through us. But, you know, over the next month, hopefully we'll, we'll knock most of that out. Um, as far as the 75 plus population is concerned, we're, we're getting to about half of those right now. And I can't say what percentage of them aren't going to want to get vaccinated or are going to want to get vaccinated. But the last clinic we did, we did a clinic uh, up at the North Carroll Senior Center, and we reached about 600 people there this week. And that one was a tough one because most of the people we signed up didn't have email or technology. And, and, uh, and trying to sign them up for their second doses kind of backed things up a little bit there at that clinic and, and, and was a little bit more of a wait for people to get out of there where Generally, we've been getting people in and out of the clinic within 20 to 25 minutes. Some, some people were there for 35 or 40 minutes, which I don't think is terrible, but uh, a, a few people who didn't have technology needed to wait in order for us to help them schedule their second appointments. Um, we've got a full court press on this week to uh, try to get people signed up. We've got two clinics in Westminster that are scheduled for Tuesday and Wednesday at the Westminster Senior Center. Um, They'll, they'll consist of, uh, it, it's, it's a total of 800 slots. We're working with your citizen services department and all the, all the health department staff that are making calls to try to sign people up who don't have email or access to the internet and get them scheduled here in, in Westminster. I do think uh, the, the demand for the uh, 75 plus is, is dropping off a bit. And, um, you know, we may, within the next three to four weeks, start opening things up to people who are 65 and older. Um, so the, the other thing that I've been trying to do is set aside about 50 doses a week to try to reach hard to reach populations. Um, we're gonna be doing a clinic in conjunction with, uh, with Access Carol this week at their, at their facility to uh, reach some high risk patients that, uh, that, that they have and people who are over that age of uh, 75 
and and just a really hard to reach uh, community. There's a lot of uh, folks that they serve that, that that could potentially be homeless or or uh, potentially be uninsured and just not have technology. So we're doing a, a clinic with them uh, this week. And then the next couple of weeks, we're going to work with LifeBridge, and we've got this thing we're, we're calling a fly car. And, and essentially, we're going to uh, give them some doses. They're going to go out, and uh, they're going to administer these to people who are homebound. And, and then they're going to uh, pick up more doses from our, our mass clinic and go out and hit some more homebound people. I've got a list of about 40 people that, uh, that the uh, Citizen Services Department gave me that are, are not able to leave their homes. And so we're hoping to have those people vaccinated in the next week or so. <laughs> Additionally, um, you know, where, where we're going from here is, uh, is trying to, the, to set aside a certain number of doses to reach any hard to reach population. I've assigned Sue Doyle, who's our behavioral health uh, bureau chief to be what we call our equity office, officer. And she's working with citizen services look at subsidized housing and other places where we have people who, who don't really have access to uh, technology to try to make sure we get those people vaccinated. And one of the important pieces that uh, we've talked about, but I want to make sure we keep advertising this, and I talked to Commissioner Rothstein about this last night, is that uh, you know the county's offered to provide transportation to and from the vaccination clinics if, uh, if somebody has a, a challenge with transportation. And, and um, that's, a, that's a great service we're providing to our citizens. I've emphasized this to our staff who are signing people up. And, you know, it's funny because I, I was personally sitting uh, sitting here one day and I had wound up with a lady and I occasionally do wind up with individuals who uh, are having a hard time getting signed up for a clinic. And I, I, I tried to help walk her through getting her signed up. And when we got towards the end, she's like, I'm not sure if my son's going to be able to take me that day. And as I'm sitting here, one of my staff walked into the office. He's like, don't forget you can get them transportation. I was like, oh, yeah. So I was like, well, if your son can't take you to that day, you can call and we can get you a ride. So it's an important piece that we need to be thinking about and we need to be advertising better to make sure that people know that uh, not having transportation is not a reason that they can't get vaccinated. And, and uh, you know, the, the, um, the State uh, Department of Aging really wants us to focus on certain uh, – certain, um, independent living facilities. And that's just not working with, with the way we have things planned. I think we're better off. We're, we're going to uh, regional sites throughout the county. We're reaching the people we need to reach. And if we need to get them transportation, we can get them there. Um, trying to get large numbers of doses out in a, in, a, in a day, as opposed to going to a place where there are 20 or 30 people, it's easier to bring those 20 or 30 people to us. We're going to reach the homebound. We're going, to, we're going to make sure that everybody's given an opportunity to get vaccinated who's vulnerable, and, and that's kind of the way that we're we're working through this. Uh, another piece that will be interesting to you guys is we're planning on sending out invitations to uh, the folks for the continuity of government. That means we can get our commissioners vaccinated, our county administrator, our, our town managers, our, our mayors, and, and the uh, council presidents. Somewhere down the road in three or four weeks, we'll be looking at trying to vaccinate some public works people, the people who run our water plants, wastewater plants, and, and uh, maintain critical infrastructure. That's still a little ways out. But the week of March the 7th, we're going to be uh, working on that uh, on those elected officials and, and essentially the uh, town and county managers. And um, we're going to be trying to start with the higher education folks. Also that week, we're, we're looking at potentially putting another 75-plus uh, another clinic down in the, in the South Carroll area. So just wanted to kind of give you an update as to where we are and where we're going with all of this. I know it's been a lot of information this morning. I've been trying to give you what I think you need to know without making it too long. Uh, of course, check our website, call our call center. Uh, anything we can do to assist people with trying to help them navigate this process, we want to do. We're still very much resource constrained. We don't have enough vaccine to vaccinate everybody who wants to be vaccinated. And we've got to reach the most vulnerable people first. So that's all I have. And commissioners, I'd be glad to uh, to take any questions you would have in, in reference to what I just presented. And as always, thank you. Um, any questions, comments, direction? I just want to thank 
I want to thank Mr. Singer and Mrs. Coons for coming on every week. I think the service you provide during session is so beneficial to our public, but to charts and graphs and put it in perspective, it makes their job easier because if they weren't getting this information from you in these sessions, they'd be calling us wanting to know stuff that we don't know. So as always, thanks for all the effort you guys put into putting this together. It makes their job easier. And, and it eliminates a lot of rumors and innuendos out there. When people have ignorance and they, they worry about stuff. So all this information is real beneficial to the public. So thanks for all the effort you and your staff put into this. Okay. So, yeah, please. So with that said, uh, I appreciate it too, but I've got one, two, three, four, five, six people that have contacted me in the last 48 hours, Ed, in my district, all of them over 75. What do I tell them? Commissioner, if, if you've got a list of four people, send it to me. Um, we're, we're, uh... I've got six right now, and I know they're all over 75. And you know my district. My district has a lot of folks over 75, and, and I, you know, I appreciate what Commissioner Boucher said, but uh, most of those folks don't watch us on on Tuesdays and Thursday mornings, nor do they have a computer, nor do they have internet to be able to do that. So uh, I need to tell them something. Right, and, and, and we're trying to reach out through uh, citizen services and all, and, and first of all, I wanna verify that we're trying, to, we, we, we've, we've tried to reach everybody who's on our list. Some people aren't calling us back and aren't answering the phone. I mean, I can't register them if they don't answer the phone. That's that's a hard part, but if you send me a list of people who, who, who you know want to be vaccinated, we'll reach out to them and, and we'll make an effort to, to, uh, to register them for a clinic. So if, if you've got a list, you know, any of you commissioners, if you've got a list, please send it to us. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll work on it. If, if you've got a name and a phone number, we'll, we'll try to get to them. Yep, I've got all that. So I'll get that to you later on this morning. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> Anything else? Okay, again a lot of information uh, to be shared and thank you for uh, coming on Ed. Thanks commissioners. Have a great day. Thanks. Let's move on to uh, fire EMS uh, director. Uh, Bob McCoy should be on share with us. What's uh, what's happening uh, from Tuesday to today <laughs> and what you want to uh, share with us. All right. Good morning, commissioners. I appreciate the opportunity to join you again. Um, Chris, if I can share my screen, for a presentation. <clears throat> All right, thank you, Chris. All right, as we have done weekly, I'm not gonna go through the initial three primary questions. Uh, we've been through that, but I will scale through the um, slides for people to get a quick glimpse of. But what we wanna talk about today is Bob, we're here. Yes, Bob, can yes. you make it a? a yes, I'm motor? sorry. Yeah. Right. Forgot to do that. But what we want to talk about is uh, the milestone goals uh, that we've been touching on with the updates uh, since November 12th. We've been working on the MOU, budget, hiring, and the public safety training center. Those are the goals that we've been working towards. So today's objective is to present station staffing and safer grant options for FY22. There's no action required of the commissioners today. This is basically information presented for review, but we will be returning um, each week, obviously, but we will be returning next week for direction on the safer application. Uh, we will need a decision on that. So when we look at our current staffing, uh, Carroll County is comprised of 14 fire and EMS stations. 13 of the 14 currently have station employees employed through funding and fundraising activities of each volunteer station. Our recommendation has always been to transition employment responsibilities uh, from the stations to the county to mirror the existing employee complement. Basically at Westminster, has 24 positions assigned, we would fulfill 24 positions and try to mirror those that service delivery. 
when we look at the assignment of personnel, uh, we're giving you a breakdown um, that we've been utilizing in the budget process. We have one station that will require 24 personnel, that's station three in Westminster. One station that would require, or I'm sorry, three stations that would require 20 personnel, station 12 in Sykesville, one in Mount Airy, and five in Tawnytown. Bob, is that 20 total or is that 20 per station? 20 per station, I'm sorry. And then the 12 per station for the remaining nine stations, that excludes Harney. Uh, what this basically gives us is a minimum of one EVOD and one EMS crew at all stations. It provides one EVOD and two EMS crews at the stations 12, 1, and 5, the stations that have 20. And at station 3 in Westminster, it provides two EMS crews, one EVOD, and one officer, which they currently have. Now, are you including Reese in this as well? That's correct. Nine. Okay. Down in the upper. This okay. encompasses all stations with the exception of Harney. Okay. So our original department hiring goal uh, was bi-monthly hiring effective uh, July, 2021. Uh, that's what has driven our work steps. Uh, all the offices in the county government that uh, will be impacted by the fire EMS department. Uh, we would prioritize by staffing the busiest stations first, which would provide service to the highest populated areas, the highest call volume areas, would also provide us the ability to evaluate the employment processes that are in place and get an idea quickly um, what the needs of the other departments within county government are to support the fire EMS department and to provide optimal coverage for effective use uh, of available funding. So hiring options, new considerations. Uh, we understand this is gonna be a difficult budget process based on many factors, both legislative and, and needs of the county. Uh, we understand the goal is uh, may be adjusted uh, based on the budgetary priorities. And to achieve the maximum employee coverage for FY22, uh, we do want to uh, reinforce that this SAFER grant is available to us. So to go over the SAFER grant uh, briefly, Carroll County is eligible to apply. Uh, we have confirmed recently what used to be a step down funding over a three year grant. It is the last two fiscal years, they have, the federal government has made it 100% salary and benefits for all three years. There is no cost share or maintenance of effort associated. The, there are no budget supplanting restrictions, uh, which is huge. Application is due March 12th. Uh, the awards usually start mid to late May and usually are completed by the start of the next uh, federal fiscal year and October 1st. <laughs> so that leaves us with uh, two hiring questions uh, that we need to, to work on, and that's how many stations do we want to budget for, and how many safer positions would you like to apply for? So I wanna switch to um, two matrices that we were working on. First one is going to be the safer grant. Can everybody see that okay? We can. Okay. All right. When we look at the safer grant, and uh, I, I had the opportunity to sit down with Chris Weinbrenner and Roberta on this and really bounce some ideas off of each other. With the exceptions that are being permitted with the safer grant for this fiscal year, I absolutely see no reward in not applying for this grant. When you look at the risk associated by not applying, it will be 100% county funding to start this up. We lose the opportunity to utilize federal funds to get started. There will be a delay in providing personnel assistance to the volunteers, which has driven the county to uh, develop the fire EMS department. 
potential continues for response deficiencies. And we're not sure of the uh, future of the grant. Every year, the amount of funding and whether the grant will be continued is always in question. So those are the risks associated. So when we look at option, uh, the option two, which is applying for the grant, we look at the rewards and we're lo looking at federal funding for salary and benefits, no call share, it's 100% funding for salary and benefits, uh, budget to planning exception for FY uh, for the fiscal year, no maintenance of effort, potential to meet the original FY22 goal of six stations utilizing both budget and or safer funding. It will assist in long-term budget development as you work on your six year plan uh, it allows for strategic placement of personnel to be achieved. As I stated before, the, the original goal of six stations provides coverage, effective coverage to all regions of the county and will allow us to be able to reevaluate if conditions change over the next year. It assists, uh, we, we do have an advantage of being a new department with the first application. We've never applied before. Uh, system meeting NFPA 1720 as far as deployment of resources and response times for volunteer stations. Reduced need for mutual aid. If we have staff units, that one unit can handle a call. I'll give an example. My neighborhood, oftentimes, depending on the time of day, sometimes it takes three ambulances to handle one uh, call based on the staffing. Provides us options to staff additional EMS units. It will provide uh, consistent EMS supervision uh, across the county instead of 13 individual employers. Uh, we will be able to provide a, a supervisor per shift uh, for all the EMS uh, providers. And definitely will give us opportunities for operational enhancements, peak period units, uh, the ability to move personnel and physical resources uh, to cover gaps. The risk, uh, Basically, does that cover soft costs, uniforms, protective clothing, things like that, things that we're going to have to pay for regardless. And we do assume all costs on year four. So that's where I'm at on the safer grant. I'm going to switch real quick. And please stop me if you have any questions. But I'm going to switch real quick to the hiring options. And what we did is we did another matrix of three options and looking at it strictly from a budgetary uh, perspective, budget two stations, budget three stations or budget four stations. Uh, we did believe uh, through discussions with my budget analyst and with Roberta, um, four may be the maximum that we would look at for a uh, budget this year. Uh, that's before we had any information based on safer. So if we budget two stations, uh, estimate about 1.7 million above what we currently spend. Reward is that's the minimum county investment, but the other reward is the two busiest stations would be staffed through budget. So we continue to do in order of, of uh, activity. Station three in Westminster, station 12 in Sykesville would be chosen. That is 50.49% of the call volume in Carroll County. Risk. Limited resources to assist in service delivery. Longest delay in providing volunteers assistance if we only do two stations in one fiscal year. Potential for continued response deficiencies. Uh, we still are basically operating as individual companies uh, with individual employers at each station. Minimal economies of scale uh, as the applies to the county. The least budget efficiencies, least operational consistency and still the most burden on the individual fire companies. Now with this matrix, it, the risk and rewards gradually increase and or decrease as you go to option two, budgeting three stations. So I'll move over to uh, option three, which is four stations. That's estimated at about 3.7 million above what we spend currently. The reward four stations will be covered through the budget and that is 65% of the call volume in Carroll County. For this fiscal year, it'll provide the most assistance to the volunteers based on the, this plan. Uh, it's provide the least delay in providing that assistance, the best economy of scales for FY22, 
the least amount of burden on those individual volunteer companies that provide that 65% of the coverage. Uh, most budget efficiencies uh, will assist greatly as we move uh, into the next fiscal year, uh, being able to evaluate the impact of four uh, stations on the county budget. It will provide the most operational efficient consistency for this fiscal year. And it continues to move us towards the one department concept. Um, I, we put in risk, there's still potential for response deficiencies with only four of 13 stations covered. So when we talk about the budget requirements, um, the safer opportunities, um, we definitely need to approach from the perspective that safer is not guaranteed. Uh, you are faced with prioritizing a great deal of needs this year. I've watched all these meetings and uh, I know a lot of legislative items uh, and just the fact that the fire department is starting up, there's a lot of uh, prioritizing that needs to happen. But as a county government, we are now committed to a fire and EM EMS department and our volunteers need our assistance. So it is my recommendation um, that you budget based on the public priorities, but utilize the safer opportunity to reach our goal of six stations for FY22. Um, with the exceptions presented in the safer uh, notice of funding, we may not get this opportunity again to request this amount of assistance for the initial startup and move some of those costs down the road to where we can uh, better prepare for that. So I appreciate this opportunity to present to you um, and I'm available for any questions you may have. Okay, Bob, thanks. Um, Comments, questions, discussion on? Yeah. Uh, Bob, so, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, under level four, you had 3.7 well, million or whatever. Uh, does that include additional staffing where you will need in the county, like with HR and those type of things to support this? Or is this just only the fire department um, salaries at that point? To my knowledge, if I remember correctly, I don't know if Ted's on with me, that was basically the salaries and benefits of the fire EMS department. So you don't have an idea on an additional cost to the county for, oh, maybe Ted's here now. Uh, you know, the other things we're not seeing here that it's gonna cost. That's correct. And just for clarification that I did not add uh, for simplicity, the, um, these estimates are based on hiring all these stations on July 1st. It does not take into account if we stagger the hiring um, and maybe move the second station six months away. This is all just based on a full year of salary and benefits for each option. Okay, it does include an assumption of some, or some internal staff, but it, may be, it might not be everything that we're going to need to look at. Right now, it does include, uh, I assume, three positions in human resources, uh, one in risk management, and one in budget. And though, if, if we apply for the SAFER grant, as it's written today, uh, this year's uh, grant opportunity, all of the uh, fire EMS costs or salary and benefits would be paid for by the grant if we were successful um, for the first three years. Um, and as Bob said, of course, then the county would have to pick up year four and beyond. Um, but uh, but the the but that would only be for the fire EMS personnel. So any of the costs associated with those HR or um, budget or risk uh, positions would still remain, as would those soft costs that Bob referred to earlier. Bob, uh, please take down the uh, slides so we see. Go ahead, Commissioner Frazier. Yeah, Bob, I have a question. Can you only apply for the safer grant one time? In other words, if we, let's just say, just for sake of argument, we went with option one right now. So this year, we start with two stations. We apply for a safer grant for them. Next year, we go for two more or four more, whatever it is. Can we apply for another safer grant for those other stations at that time? And do we That's get three, three? So you get three years from that time as well. Yeah, you can have concurrent uh, safer uh, awards. Is that normal? Does that happen? 
Um, there's only approximately 300 awards made nationally per year. Um, so that's why, uh, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not confident that we could get two in a row or, or two over three years. I do feel being a new department with a startup based on how we write the narrative, we have our best shot, uh, this time. So that's a significant assumption that we get it one time that we may get it a second time. But right. the assumption is that we would be picking up the bill after three years, correct? After four, on the fourth year, that's correct. And the, the, the one of the big key issues with SAFER is they also uh, provided exceptions to <clears throat> high tech employees that are laid off. So a lot of times we're competing with larger cities that have faced layoffs in public safety. Just this false sense of security after you know, achieving where we're going with a three-year grant, which is not a bad thing because it's given us, you know, right. three years, but are we kicking the can down the road before we have to make decisions? So well, that's the good thing about having a five-year budget cycle, right, Ted? Yes. <laughs> the grants scare me, but this is one that I think we're going to need because uh, of the fourth year. Look out, it hits like a, a brick. But um, yeah, I, do we have any idea on all the soft costs, what they add up to be, Roberta, Ted, any idea on that in additional? What, what are you calling soft costs? All the uniforms, all the things that aren't in the grant. Uh, I mean, somebody has to be looking at an idea here what that's going to cost additional. Yes, we, we do have estimates. I, I don't have anything sitting right in front of me. Yeah, I've been working with Taylor. Um, Taylor, I believe, might be out today. Uh, we do have money set aside for PPE, um, for uniforms, items like that. That's also an item that's going to be addressed through the MOU and working with each station. Is any employees that were that do transition from station employment to county employment, the PPE and maybe the non um, <laughs> the uniform items that don't have identifiers on there, like a, uh, an individual volunteer patch or logo, um, should be able to transition and those employees should be able to continue to utilize those, uh, which should share, um, save us some of those expenses. So right now we, we do know that we would have to fully outfit any new employees that come, that come to the county. And we have money set, um, budgeted for that. Okay. Uh, Anything else? Yeah, commissioners, just there's a couple other not so obvious things that ought to be in, in your thinking. Um, one, remember, we, we have to hire all these people. You know, so one thing that we, we need to be thinking about is how quickly can we hire people? And then that also ties to a provision of the safer grant. If we are awarded the grant, we have to be using it within 90 days. So that means we need to be very confident that however many people we to get for, that we can actually have that many people working uh, very, very quickly. Six uh, wasn't it six months, Ted? We had six months. Uh, okay, I, I thought yeah. it was not, but I, I might be wrong. Yeah, I believe it's six months. Uh, to uh, from recruitment to hiring. Okay. Did I miss yeah. the, the Did I miss the breakdown of the individuals we would be hiring? Uh, their Their level of training. Absolutely. Because we can only hire we can only hire firefighters, correct? You can You can hire firefighter EMTs, firefighter paramedics, under the Safer Grant. Okay. Because that, that, I think, needs to come into play here, too. Uh, you know, the emphasis has always been that, you know, EMS is, is the most urgent issue that we have right now. Uh, and, listen, I'm all about safer grants. I think they're, they're, they're great. Uh, the problem is it drops off the edge of the cliff but after right. three years. So you really got to make sure. But, again, that's why we do our five-year budget. So that, that's good. But um, the, the emphasis has always been on EMS. And so – I want to make sure that if we're going to go through with this, that can we set parameters of who we're hiring? Uh, 
and to, to be blunt, I guess, I don't want to throw 50 firefighters into our stations when we need EMS. That's where we're really, that, that's, that's where we should be uh, focusing on right now. Um, so shouldn't we be able to prioritize? Well, which? that's where I'm at. I'm not, yeah. I've done these safer grants before, yeah. but not to this level. So, you know, how do we prepare as a county to ensure that right. we are putting an emphasis on EMS with the safer grant application? We, we will be hiring or try, striving to hire firefighter slash EMS, <clears throat> whether they're firefighter EMT or firefighter paramedic not assigning them in the stations per role, we will be providing resources to the stations for the volunteer officers to assign. And if that priority at that station is the uh, ambulance, then that those employees, county employees will be assigned to the ambulance to meet the EMS needs. But we are providing cross-trained employees for the volunteers to utilize as they see fit. Okay. so. We've got, um, we've got six months to hire these folks. Once we are given, uh, once we the safer grant is accepted in Carroll, correct? That is correct. So between now and then, anticipating that we probably would get something, uh, because we are a new department, uh, I would ex I would assume that you're that you will be putting together a prior prioritization list of of where the individuals need to go. Uh, again, I want to be clear here that this whole time that we've been working on this, it's it's been about emergency medical services. That's why I was, I, I want to, that the focus needs to be on that. So, I listen, yeah. I don't, I think it's a good idea. I, I really do. As long as we put the right emphasis on the right personnel, uh, I don't, uh, it's going to save us at least out of the gate for the first three years, a good bit of money. Uh, it really is. And maybe if we do put in for those, we can, we can then put our focus with our own money, our own budget money on other personnel or something. I, you know, you know, instead of trying to get on all in right, right. away. So, um, what, what's your, how many people would you be putting in for Bob again? I saw the slides, but I'm, I'm trying to break this stuff down. I guess you'll give us the, you can give us the, the PowerPoint, but uh, how many personnel would you be putting in for with the initial application for the safer grants? That'll be based on your decision of how many you want to budget and how many you want to apply. If you want to apply for the six, for the uh, FY 22 goal of six stations, right. Uh, be 108 personnel total. Okay. Wait, I apologize. Say that one more time. It would be 108 if we wanted to meet all six stations for FY22. But you only had four on that on that uh, chart you showed us. That was for that was how many you want to actually budget if the safer grant is not approved. Well, well, that's the way we have to look at it. And then, and, right. and even if we get to safer grant, which would be fantastic, we still right. have to budget for that in the out years. So that's the yeah. number I would be looking at. So, but yeah, so you only you, gave us you only gave us the number for up to four stations, not right. up to. Right. So I, I, we're going to have to look at that with the six if you want us to look because I don't have the number for that. Yeah. Without the safer grant, the two year two station plan is forty four. The three station plan is 64 and the four station plan is 84. 44, you said 44, 64 and 84, right, Bob? That's correct. Okay. And yeah, it's, yeah, go ahead. It's your, it, it's your feeling that, that, that we stand a really good chance we should ask for as many as we can because we stand a good chance of getting them because of the fact that we're a brand new department. Is that your, is that where your, your thinking is there? My, yes. My, my belief is we have committed 
to building a fire and EMS department. So we're going to address the personnel needs eventually, uh, depending on how many fiscal years it takes to do that. Uh, but this is an opportunity for 100% salary benefit funding. And I think we should take the biggest bite of the apple we can. Right. Although the phased in approach is really attractive too, because if we put a safer grant in and do the first phase now, and then next year we put another safer grant in and, and, and right. get another grant, yeah. then right. instead of that year <clears throat> four being so huge for the county, then you've got year four that's not too bad, year five that's eh, year right. six that's okay. So it, it sort of phases it in, if you will. But the likelihood of getting the second grant may not be as well, positive I mean, as getting a lot right. of the first. So. I, I would think that if in our, in our <clears throat> you know, we weigh in the options here, I would yeah. think that if it, in the narrative, you know, that would be something that we could, we could say, uh, you know, look, we're, we don't, we're, we don't want to go all in here because we have a lot of budget constraints here, but what we're attempting to do is phase in, which is what we've been trying to do all along. Right. right? So. Yeah. I don't know if there's a place on a safer ground where you could put that narrative in there saying, yeah. this is what we're planning right now, but next year we're planning two more next year, we're planning to whatever it happens to be to let them know what we're trying to accomplish here that would be a good idea to include that even if there's not a spot for yeah, it, no. yeah. you know, an extra paper to, to look at that if we decide to go that way. But it's, it's an option. Cause I do like you said, like the option of three years from now, we have this amount and then right. another year have a little bit more, right. another year have a little bit more. That's a little easier to handle, but yeah, it's just, it's a toss up if we're going to get those next two or not. Yeah. I can see both. I can right. really, I can see both options here as being yeah. important. Really. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, what we have to do is, and, and I agree with you. Um, it, it really has to do with uh, the risk associated with either getting an additional safer grant um, versus, like you said, falling off the cliff when the funds aren't there. Um, once we apply them from the initial safer grant, that's you know how that that's the big deal is how are we going to have the continuation of services and put it in the budget and. Ted, you uh, want to chime in? Yes, please. Yeah, well, this idea of falling off the cliff is a risk. Uh, um, unless there is still still some question about us providing these services, I'm, I'm not sure that that's really what we're up against. Uh, what, we're what we're talking about is either paying for all these costs moving into the future or getting a grant in the short term and still paying all the costs in the long term. Uh, there's, there's, there's no cliff. We're, we're already planning to take all these costs. So if we think getting the grant is a good idea, and there are things we need to think about before, before we say yes, but if we take the grant, all it's doing is keeping us from paying some of the costs for a portion of the time. Will we be able to sustain it with the funds we have now and expectations of our budget and revenue coming in, would we be able to sustain it after three years, after the initial cost that the safer grant will provide? Well, we're, we will have to figure out how we are going to sustain it, unless right. you're going to make a decision not to provide the services. Right. But as we've been talking about the, you know, what our long-term plan looks like, this is one of the things we've been, been talking about because we know this is coming and why I've been saying we need to figure out how we are going to accommodate these costs. Yeah, I'm not against it. I'm for it. It's just how do we phase it in where we're ex it's kind of expectation management? Do we do it uh, with a large group and then figure out how to sustain it? Do we do it with a smaller group and then sustain it with a little bit ease, easier approach with the budget? Um, how aggressive do we want to be with the safer grant using those dollars? And will we be, I mean, that, that's the, the whole piece of this is how are we going to uh, sustain whatever we're going to use with the safer grant? Um, Once you're in, you're in. Right, so, exactly. You know, you're going to have to just budget it and move, <laughs> move forward accordingly. Right, I we mean, can't hire people for three years and say thanks. Yeah. I mean, there's <laughs> articles out there, and, and you know this, there's articles out there with this false sense of, you know, ideas that we have all this money. And we have all this additional money just to throw out to different, you know, organizations. Um, this is a pretty 
clear message, we don't. And as we're growing this department, as we've committed to doing, that possibly some of that money will be used to sustain, you know, out in the out years. Um, but, uh, you know, th this should be a very clear message to, to a whole lot of folks that this is a tough one. And, how, and what is the risk associated and how guarded do we want to be uh, after committing to doing this? So. Or I think we need a spreadsheet. I mean, if we can visualize all the different costs and how this is going to come together. Uh, and Ed, I agree with you. Sustainability of this is, I guess, a concern of ours, but we're committed. We're moving in this direction. I, I like what I'm hearing, Bob. I mean, it's not uh, bad at all. I just want to be able to see it uh, with all costs involved over the uh, three years. And, and Ted, I'm sure you've already worked a lot of this out on how we can get there. And I'm sure when we get into budget, we're going to be looking at this, but we have to be able to get this thing moving and sustain it uh, for perpetuity probably here uh, in this case. And uh, Steve, one comment. I know our focus is on um, uh, EMTs, EMS service, but fire and EMS are so combined, is my opinion of it. We do train, we have the people there, we uh, are able to use them as uh, the fire department needs to. And I think that's valuable uh, uh, for us to have that combination of everything as we move forward. You, you get so specialized sometimes, you can't do other things, but, uh, is it possible to, I guess, Taylor or somebody put together a spreadsheet and we can actually see the numbers of all these things? I mean, that's a huge task, I know. Uh, and it's all projection uh, at this time, but it would give us a, a starting point for each of these and see how it works. And, and I'm all for the safer grant. And I think if they're going to offer it to us, take advantage of it as long as we can sustain it. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think, but the, you brought up two two specific issues. One, the spreadsheet. I absolutely agree. We need to see it. And us, you know, Bobby, you're doing great in getting us to have this discussion. But the second piece you brought up was a question about EMS and fire. And you know, for me, I need some clarification. Are they cross trained? So when we say fire, we're associating that with EMT or EMS. I'm. I don't know. So that's something. You know, either yeah, Mr. Well, Lance or Bob. Yeah. 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 Listen, I think it's very important. I, I I would hope, and Bob knows this, that the emphasis would be on making sure we hire folks that would be cross trained. Or when you hire them, I know some jurisdictions have hired them as firefighters and then said, you know, within the next six or eight months, you need to get your, uh, you were hired based on getting either your EMT or your, your paramedic. I know some jurisdictions have done that as well. Hey, just a question, Bob, then if we get these safer grants and we're, we're going after this group, which is, which I, again, I'm not against be clear. I just want to make sure the devil's always in the details on these things. Uh, what happens with the EMS billing money that we were talking about? Does that get this? How, how does that come into play with our future uh, fiscal uh, overlook of our department? That would, um, we would still be moving and we're working on that through the MOU process, but we would still be working at as we enter a station, we would get receive the EMS billing to offset uh, the budget shortfall that we expect uh, with assuming employment responsibilities. Okay, and I guess we could, I mean, there's many things that we could do with that, including uh, training of, 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 entry level firefighters, you know, pro providing that so that they could get the training that we need them to get. And re refresh my memory, Bob, can you hire on this safer grant entry level uh, firefighters with the anticipation that they have a set of parameters to be trained additionally for emergency medical services? In the discussions I had uh, with panel uh, members from the safer grant and from different federal grants, their job description needs to reflect that their primary responsibility is firefighting. Um, understanding that their role is going to be moving back and forth between EMS and fire. 
So that will allow us to apply for the grant. Uh, we have no responsibility to show percentage of service delivery per employee. So the cross training uh, ability, the cross training, the being certified as firefighters allows us to apply for this grant. Uh, and like I said, we will base our hiring based on EMS training first with the desire to cross train. If we have an EMS only member that applies and, and gets hired, then we will provide a path to fire training, a career development path. But then we would be able to provide cross train resources to the stations for the station volunteer officers to assign to whichever unit they want. And the reason I, I say that is because I also don't want to deter volunteer EMS only members. If, if we have a station that has two volunteer EMS people that want to ride the ambulance themselves, that gives the volunteer officer the opportunity to put cross train county resources on their fire trucks and allow their members to ride the ambulance. So it just provides more options um, with cross train employees. Commissioners, what have their, uh, have you taken this to their volunteer partners out there yet, or you just bring it to us first? And then uh, I, I'd like to hear you know, from the fire departments what they think about this idea too. Uh, have you expressed or told them about this or at this point? This, this has been my message to the volunteer presidents, chiefs, CC Visa, ESAC, everyone else since the day I started was that the county committed to building a fire and EMS department for the future, not to patch immediate needs, but to build for the future. Um, so the cross training of resources, the uh, ability for the volunteers to assign our personnel where they need, uh, the rollout order as far as the busy stations first, uh, and the number of personnel have all been discussed. In fact, we had one increase in personnel and that's because the volunteer stations told me they needed more people. Uh, where some stations I just had EMS on, um, covered, they said, no, we need a driver. So this basis, uh, this plan that I've communicated for months uh, basically addressed the minimal needs and the minimum staffing that we're currently providing through station employees. I mean, this sounds like this is good news. This sounds like we're, we're moving in the right direction. You found uh, other people's money to use uh, to be applied in establishing our department. Um, you know, a lot of the discussion is about sustainability, uh, but I think the, the buy-in from the community um, is there because this is the direction we're going. Um, and, and commission. Yeah, Commissioner, please. if I can add one thing, one of the exceptions for the last two fiscal years is there's no maintenance of effort. Um, so beyond the three years, we could always reevaluate um, our position complement and funding. Uh, but we did commit to building a fire EMS department in there. And even if we only do four stations, there's still nine more out there that need assistance. So I don't see us moving backwards, even though there is no maintenance of effort. Once we jump, we jump. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, it, what Commissioner Wayne just shared is, you know, once we start moving forward and we're going forward, then it ain't like we're going to start looking back. We, we're going to be moving forward. Um, okay. Anything hey. else? Yeah, yes, please. Can I make a couple of comments. Okay. Okay. It just this goes back to a number of things that have come up now. You know, we're talking about sustainability. Right now, we know that our projected revenues over a handful of years are not enough to cover our projected costs. Part of those projected costs are the cost of providing these services that we're talking about today. So when we figure out how do we sustain our entire budget, part of that is gonna be how do we sustain this effort? Now, billing came up. I just want to make sure you understand uh, that's not going to be extra money. We're already figuring that into the net costs of, of what we're going to do here. What new costs are we taking on against what new revenue are we going to get through, through the billing? And yes, we do have estimates for what all this is going to cost, what this looks like. And um, we, we believe that the additional amount we're going to need to come up with 
after we've included the, the billing revenue increase to us is something like $7 million a year at full implementation. And on this idea of phased implementation, I don't think this is primarily a budget question because we have to plan for how are we gonna pay for this when it's fully implemented, however quickly or slowly we do it. I think the, the, something you need to think about in the phase in though is our ability to hire, train, and build the support system for all these people. That could be a, a bigger question for you on how quickly we go than the budget question is. And one other thing I'd like to add to that, I totally agree with um, what Ted said. This year, as, is, as was last year, um, is unique um, um, in that there, as Bob said, there's no maintenance of effort requirement going forward. So if, if there was some kind of retrenchment, we could um, with, this, with this grant application. And then also there's no supplanting, uh -huh. um, uh, anti-supplanting rule. So meaning you can actually budget for the stations you want and, and still apply for this grant. And if you're successful in receiving this grant, you can put that money right back in your budget and you don't spend your money, you spend their money. That is not normal. Uh, almost every grant prohibits that. And um, so you have a unique opportunity here to, um, to, to use you know, that, um, that flexibility. Un understood. Flexible. So we're, the announcement ain't, is not till uh, October 21. We'll have gone through the budget process so going through the budget process, we are going to make an, as, an assumption that the safer grant will be awarded. Right, so what, what I think makes sense to do um, is to budget for what you feel is the right level. And, um, and then um, get when you, when, if and when we're successful in getting the safer grant, then you use their money instead. Um, the um, what when before we were sure that the supplanting rules were going to be suspended um, right. for this fiscal year in this application process, we were going to uh, suggest a model where you would um, do a budget for X number of stations and then apply for a, a couple additional stations, for example. So if you budgeted for two, the county would be on the hook for the two and then you'd apply for, let's say, two more, hypothetically, one more, two more, whatever. And that that, that would be the, the extra two, so to speak, would be what would be covered by the SAFER grant because you couldn't use the SAFER grant to supplant the money from the county. But now you have that flexibility. Does that make sense? Not really. Well, <laughs> No, it, no it's, it, there's a lot of, there, there's so many opinions here. I'm not yeah. sure that we are where we need to be right now. Uh, you know, we're hearing from Ted, we're hearing from Roberta, uh, we're hearing from Bob. Could I suggest that, that we get, and not, I'm not disparaging anyone here. I'm, I, uh, sort of along the lines of what Commissioner Weaver said, could we actually see the numbers as what it, what it would mean to us? We still have time before March the 12th understanding that you are still working towards getting this safer grant not, don't mm -hmm. stop bob you know do the narrative and all that but before we make a decision here today with mm -hmm. all this stuff that's being thrown upon us here by everybody no no uh, no, no we're not uh, asking for any decision today as, as bob said okay. this is the information right. we're, so okay. we're back. We, still, we actually have two we maybe three sessions before we Correct. get to the march 12th Two, maybe three. Okay, we could throw another one in. Uh, <laughs> we always throw them in. Uh, so that, and then maybe just get into the weeds a little bit more with the numbers is where I'm kind of going with this. Sure, I, uh, I agree. You know, to kind of spread it out, if you will, across the, the, and and honestly, right now out of the gate with which what has been presented today, I'd really like, well, I'd like to see all the sets of numbers, whether it's the 44, the 84, or 44, 64, 84, I guess. But based on what we're hearing right now, it sounds like 84 would be the place we're going right now because we, we can get that big bite of the apple, yeah, right? That, right? Right. But I'd like to see those numbers spread out across 
how we do it with our yeah. budget. I, I, I agree. Right, right, right now, right now, there's two and, and try to include those soft numbers. Yeah. Uh, so that we and they don't have to be precise, but just a, maybe a ballpark, Bob, on what the soft numbers are, uniforms, mm -hmm. blah blah blah. Um, the um, and and um, I think Ted said that the internal positions were included in those figures. Is that is that yeah a yes? But yet we're not getting those through the safer grant, right? We can't apply for them through this. So I'm a little confused about what you said there, Ted. Okay, the, the numbers Bob was showing you includes an assumed five new positions. We have not had any big discussion with you yet on what positions might go. So it could be it could be others besides that. If we yeah, go for a staple grant, those would not be eligible. So right. the, the grant would be for some smaller number than the total you just saw. Yeah, exactly. This and that's another reason why let let's re, let's make those separate from what we're getting yeah. from the safer grant. Let's separate the pers internal personnel that we need uh, so that we can see what that is. And then that, that would be, I think, a good, a better way to see it here um, so that we know exactly what's going to happen here. Because, you know, I've been talking about the internal positions, and we're going to have to get them on board like yeah. yesterday. Right. <laughs> so, no, yeah, I, I agree. You, I can't, think... you can't hire an HR person and say, hey, by the way, tomorrow. Right. <laughs> you're hiring 40 firefighters and they're like wait wait what so uh you know we're going to have to really start to work on that too but if we could see that breakdown for next week and and what it exactly means i think that would be a big help but uh i don't think there's any question about going after these safer grants right. yeah. i just think we need to see the details bob yeah. i think you hit the mark in uh building the discussion uh, and providing us the information as you want to do you got direction for uh, next week i think um we're going to just continue to build fidelity into this because uh, right now there's just too many assumptions for us to think through. And like Commissioner Wentz said, because I was feeling the same way, a lot of opinions. So let's kind of narrow the shock group and we'll move forward. So, okay. Anything else for the good of the group? Okay, hearing none, let's get uh, Mr. Burke on uh, to discuss on proceeding to public hearing, uh, where am I? For the Carroll County Ethics Ordinance, our annual certification requirement. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, back in January, January 28th, I was in front of you explaining to the board that uh, each year I have to certify to the state board of ethics that our ordinance meets or exceeds uh, the requirements in the state law. And in doing a quick review of our uh, local ordinance, I know that there were some provisions that needed to be updated in order for me to be able to certify to the State Ethics Commission that we meet or exceed their law. Uh, we met on the 28th and I introduced this, the proposals to you and you authorized me to go to public hearing. We advertised the public hearing on February the 11th and February 18th of this year. And briefly, if I could uh, go through our slides again with you. And Brian Mobley is our ethics administrator. He's not with us today, but he is watching today. So very quickly to, to explain to you what we're doing. Next slide, please. First, we're going to remove, um, when you as elected officials have to fill out an extensive form uh, disclosing all of your interests uh, to the public or many of your interests to the public. And what this does is remove the requirement for you to disclose any interest in a mutual fund or exchange traded fund that's publicly traded on a national scale. And the reason for that is if you have uh, some money in Fidelity Select Health or, or a, a Vanguard fund, nothing that you do as a county commissioner is going to have any impact on that fund. So there's really no reason for you to have to disclose that to the public. Any questions about that? Now that's not required. That, that provision is not required by state law, but they have authorized us to remove it. So the next uh, slide deals with conflicts of interest. And this expands our conflicts of interest. Uh, we're on the third slide. Thank you. That expands our conflicts of interest uh, provisions. And this is required by state law to uh, address officials. And officials are appointees of the Board of County Commissioners. 
They're not elect elected officials are already covered by this. You are already covered by this. But this expands to cover officials, which would be, for example, appointees of, uh, to the Board of Zoning Appeals or the Planning Commission that are made by the, the county commissioners. And the red, uh, the red paragraph is what we're inserting, and it states that officials cannot uh, indirectly or directly initiate a solicitation for a person to retain uh, a particular lobbyist or lobbying firm. Uh, an official other than elected official can, need, cannot use public resources or the title to solicit a contribution. And elected official, that's you, may not use public resources to solicit a contribution. Uh, that has always been a, our, our practice that the, the uh, state law merely fleshes that out for elected officials. And, any questions? So in other words, a zoning board member couldn't say, I'm the chairman of the zoning board and I want to be your next uh, county commissioner. Please send money. That's previously was not addressed. It would be addressed in our ordinance. Moving right along again to the, to the uh, conflicts of interest. This states that a former elected official, including you, the Board of County Commissioners, cannot assist or represent another party or compensation in, in a matter that is a subject of legislative action for one calendar year after the elected official leaves office. In other words, you, a uh, former county commissioner, let's say, for example, while you were on, on the board, uh, you uh, adopted extensive solar panel regulations or, or relaxed solar panel regulations. Uh, and, and you leave office six months later, but you can't come on behalf of a solar company in front of, of county commissioners to, doing lobbying for a period of one year after the, until you leave, a period of one year after the elected official leaves office, you leave office. Any questions about that? No, other than the fact that that would be fun, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, 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 that's a typical one with like the agency. Yeah, right. You can't go back in the agency for a year. So. Uh, I've been here 20 something years. I've never had a county commissioner come and say, I'm, I'm a lobbyist now and I want to. You know, <laughs> hey, let's be clear. So there's always a first. Yeah. Well, <laughs> lobbyists make a lot more money than what we do. So there's that. <laughs> Finally, speaking of lobbyists, that's a good uh, segue. Could we have the next slide, please? I'm sorry. The next slide concerns your financial disclosure form. If you uh, are a candidate for local office, currently you have, um, if you uh, file your statement of candidacy and you don't file a, uh, a disclosure form within two days, uh, you're considered to have withdrawn your candidacy. You or somebody else is considered to withdraw. The state allows you eight days. So we're gonna up that from two to eight days before we disqualify your, your candidacy. Any questions about that one? Okay, next slide, please. Now we're back to lobbying in general. Uh, currently, we have one registered lobbyist. And I think we've only had one registered lobbyist for the past 10, 15 years. And that's uh, bg &E or Constellation Energy. So for our one lobbyist, we have about seven pages of requirements for lobbyists, including <laughs> forms <laughs> that have to be filed uh, after every, uh, every action taken by a lobbyist. So, Essentially what this does is uh, require them to do a, an annual statement as opposed to a, a, a monthly statement. Because what we're getting now is 12 months of monthly statements that say we didn't do anything uh, in front of the county commissioners. So this would require them, require them to file an annual statement you know, at the end of the year as opposed to, to the monthly statements. And that in general uh, covers our, oh, there's one more, please go to slide 10 please. This is the, uh, you may recall we discussed this currently in our ethics ordinance. If you are a firm that is assisting the county with preparing a uh, specifications uh, in anticipation of putting a project out to, to bid or, uh, or uh, soliciting a request for proposals, you are uh, prohibited from then soliciting, I'm sorry, submitting a bid for the actual project. So if I'm if I hire you to design a, uh, an office building, uh, you know, architectural services to design an office building, and you put together the specs, which we, and we use the specs to put that out to bid, you cannot come in then as, uh, as on the, the official project to do the, the actual project as you design specifications. We are taking that out of uh, the ethics ordinance and we're suggesting 
that uh, it be put into our purchasing policy once our new purchasing uh, boss uh, comes on board. Frankly, people bidding on projects don't necessarily run to the ethics ordinance and look, look for this. They certainly would notice it uh, and it would be much more exposed to the public if it was in the actual purchasing policy. So we're suggesting this be removed out of there, out of our ethics ordinance and, and in the future placed in our uh, purchasing policy. Any questions about that? Anyhow, those are our proposed amendments and they would bring us into compliance with the state law and allow me to make the certification. Uh, Mr. President, at this point, if, if there are any members of the public that have any comments, uh, we, we, we'd like to hear from them. Okay, are there any members from the public that want to make comments regarding the ethics ordinance? I know we have a few callers on the line, but may not be for this. I believe we have somebody. I don't believe there. No. Are there any callers on this agenda item? Somebody looks like you're trying to talk. Hello. Yes. Are you calling about this agenda item regarding ethics? No. Okay. okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Seeing and hearing no callers on the line. Do I have a motion? We'll make a motion that the board conclude the public hearing and keep the record open for 10 calendar days. I was going to say <laughs> two, but we switch it to 10. I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay, I got a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Eric. Second. Okay, got a couple of seconds. Any further discussion on this? Seeing and hearing none, all in favor for the motion? Aye. I <laughs> no. put the thumb there. Uh -oh. Okay. Well, I mean, we're back. We're going we're with the eyes back. now. 5-0. It's okay. a big If uh, any of you were on the previous Board of County Commissioners, you'll note we're my not. surprise. And, and with our last go-round with the ethics ordinance, you'll, uh, you'll note my surprise that we have absolutely no comments on this particular one. <laughs> we, we, we are not, it's, and it is 5-0. Let's move on. <laughs> Or something changes. And for those of us that live through it, <laughs> yeah, that's uh, okay. We are good. We're all good with it. Thank you very much. Let's talk Thank about Piney much. Run. <laughs> let's talk about Piney Run Watershed. <laughs> Get Mr. Devilbiss and Mr. Hine and uh, is Jeff Blass, Mr. Blass, is Jeff showing up or no? He's on the call. Was. I'm here. Okay. <laughs> okay. So we got the three of you, and Jeff is a project manager from AECOM for the uh, Piney Run Watershed study. Okay, Tom, you want to take it? Yeah, I'll do a brief introduction. Uh, good morning, commissioners. We're here today to, to provide a briefing related to a continuation, basically, of a process that actually began for us back in 2017. Uh, at that point in time, MD gave direction to the county to do an evaluation of the Piney Run Dam in the South Carroll area. Uh, after that, the county entered into an agreement with the National Resources Conservation Service to actually fund the, the study. And that was done in January of 2019. The commissioners then awarded a contract to AECOM uh, in July of 2019 to undertake the study. We last February, if you'll recall, uh, Commissioner Rothstein, we held a public meeting down in the Ellersburg area that was right before COVID. We were able to get in a actual face-to-face -face public uh, meeting regarding the study and its outline and, and purpose. So now we're ready to present the study uh, with the results and discuss the alternatives that have been looked upon to address that direction that MD had given this county. And what we're actually doing today is providing a briefing to gain your concurrence and direction only uh, as to moving forward with the public process at this point in time. So I'm gonna turn the, the presentation over to Acting Director Hine uh, so that he can uh, give you the lowdown and specifics. Chris? That's right, Tom. You're, you're the has-been. Okay, let's get with the acting. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, can you confirm that you can see my screen? You're good. I can okay, confirm. great. So thank you very much for the time this morning. Uh, as Tom indicated, we're joined here this morning uh, by Jeff Bloss from AECOM. Uh, I'm going to give you some background on the project and uh, why we are looking at this project. 
then Jeff will talk for a little bit about the uh, results of the analysis. And then I will wrap up with some alternatives that uh, we'd like you to consider. But again, as Tom mentioned, we're not looking for an action, any action today. So let's see if this will, there we go. So we're here today to talk about Piney Run Reservoir. Uh, it was constructed in 1974, so it has almost reached uh, 50 years uh, in use. The reservoir was originally constructed for three primary purposes. That is flood control, water supply, and recreation. And uh, of those three uses, the water supply uh, has not been implemented to date, but we will be talking some about that today. So the reservoir is uh, held back by Piney Run Dam, which is a 73 foot tall dam, 600 feet long. It is the largest dam that the county owns and maintains. The reservoir that's held back by the dam is 290 acres of water. At its deepest, it's 54 feet deep, and that depth is right at the dam. In fact, if you're out there and you may notice a red buoy that's out in the water, that's hooked up to um, part of the infrastructure of the dam, and that's at the deepest point where it's 54 feet deep. And the reservoir itself holds approximately 1.7 billion gallons of water. So I wanted to just take a minute or two and talk about some of the infrastructure so that everybody's on the same page with terms and, and so on. We're talking about the dam and hopefully you can see my cursor moving back and forth. Um, we have the dam embankment itself and the picture in the upper left corner is a picture of the dam with the reservoir to the left and, and the downslope of the dam on the right. The dam holds back the reservoir and that reservoir is constantly being um, constantly has water coming into it from the various streams that flow to it. And so we need to safely pass that water through past the dam. And so the way that's done is there's what we call a principal spillway. That's the principal way that water gets past the dam. On the upstream side, there's the riser structure and the upper right corner image is the, the riser structure. So that's what controls the water level in the dam or in the reservoir. Water drops down that riser structure and goes through a pipe that then comes out into Piney Run Stream. If we have a large storm, a very large storm, that is more than that principal spillway can accommodate, the water then has to get around the dam safely, and that goes through the auxiliary spillway, which is also sometimes referred to as the emergency spillway. And that's this big wide open space that's to the, uh, at the bottom left corner of the, of the aerial photo labeled auxiliary spillway. So that's basically a big wide open channel that's designed to convey water past the dam. And we'll be talking more about that in a couple minutes. And finally, I mentioned water supply. So what was constructed in anticipation of using it at the, the reservoir for water supply is um, an intake tower. So the picture in the lower right is the intake tower that has valves that, will, that can pull water out of the reservoir. And then there's a pipe that runs through the dam and currently that pipe um, goes into the stream. But long term, what would happen is that if we implemented water supply, that pipe would be hooked up to um, all the uh, additional infrastructure needed to provide water supply. So I thought you might find this picture interesting. This is from con uh, the construction of the reservoir. Um, this is around 1973. This is just prior to the dam being constructed. This is, here's the riser structure which is uh, the top of it is what's in the upper right corner. That's, so the water level is at the top of that, the water drops down and then goes out. And then in the background is the water intake structure. So Piney Run Dam is classified by Maryland Department of the Environment Dam Safety as what is called a high hazard dam. That's an assessment of risk. And uh, this image, aerial photo shot, shows why there is a, a risk uh, associated with this dam. And this is the only high hazard dam that the county owns. So as I mentioned, there's approximately 54 feet of, of standing water behind the dam. You can imagine that during a very large storm, we could have an additional 20, 25 feet of water stacked up behind the dam. If the dam were to catastrophically fail, that would release a flood wave down the stream valley. And just downstream, we have Maryland 32. When that wave hits Maryland 32, it would still be 30 to 40 feet deep. So you can imagine that would be a catastrophic impact. And 
Our analysis shows that there are more than 240 properties and 40 road crossings downstream of the dam that would be impacted in one way, shape, or form. So there is a, a risk there. What we have to do is, as owners of that dam and working with MDE Dam Safety, is mitigate that risk, is reduce that risk. And so that classification of high hazard requires two primary things. One is that there's a high standard for operation and maintenance of the dam. And the second is, is that the dam design has to pass the most severe storm that is potential for our region, okay? So I first want to, I just want to stress this from an operation and maintenance perspective, there are no issues with the dam. So there, it's not, we're not talking about an imminent danger here or anything like that. Um, the dam is well maintained. Every year we inspect that the dam and it is inspected with not only county staff, but also staff from MDE Dam Safety and also from NRCS. And MDE Dam Safety provides a report of the inspection um, to, to indicate what condition the dam is in. And it has always been indicated in good condition and well maintained. So it's, there's not an issue with an imminent problem with the dam. I want to make sure that everybody understands that. From a compliance perspective, though, from a, a design capacity, MDE has raised an issue, they're concerned with two um, aspects of the dam. One is, is it able to safely pass that, um, that largest storm possible around the dam? So is the spillway, is the auxiliary spillway large enough to handle that flow if we have that, that large storm event? The other uh, issue that they have raised is the erodibility of that spillway. It, it's an earthen spillway. And so if you had a large storm, a lot of water going through that, could that spillway erode and potentially fail the dam? So those are the two issues that they've raised with us. And they have basically indicated that they're requiring us to analyze the dam to see if those issues are, are a problem. And if they are, we are required to mitigate those issues by 2027. So that's what then led to hiring of AECOM to perform the analysis and, and determine if those issues are, are founded. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jeff Bloss and you can discuss um, the results of the study. Thank you, Chris. Uh, good morning, commissioners. My name is Jeff Bloss. I'm a uh, project manager with AECOM. AECOM was retained by the county to perform the, uh, the NRCS funded watershed study. Um, and I want to discuss a little bit about what we've done and what we found and then where we go from here. So the first thing uh, we were tasked with doing was performing a very exhaustive uh, inspection, both inside now of the, of the dam and all of its, all of its structures, and then um, engineering analyses from several different uh, aspects um, for, of the dam. And so uh, we did visual inspections of, of the dam. We, we, um, put um, camera, remote control cameras up all the pipes to check the insides and see how they, what condition they were in. Um, and and we, we also uh, performed um, some surveys of, of the dam and the reservoir. Um, and then we performed a number of engineering analyses, including those for hydrology and hydraulics, which is study of how the water runs off the, off the watershed into the reservoir and then goes downstream. Uh, we looked at geotechnical aspects of the dam, uh, how safe the, the how stable the embankment is, um, and and what's underlying the dam and its foundation and the spillway. Uh, more importantly, uh, we drilled uh, 25 different uh, soil borings or holes in, in to collect samples. Uh, we also performed an analysis of sedimentation of the reservoir. Um, so this is a look at at how much sediment has run into the reservoir and accumulated over its life. And then finally, we also performed um, environmental, environmental, cultural, and archaeological surveys of the area around the dam. Um, and you can see some of the artifacts that were found in the picture on the lower right. Um, we also found some, some old foundations for, that predated uh, the, the construction of the dam. Next slide, please. Next slide, Chris. Thank you. Um, so, with the with respect to MDE's uh, directives uh, to investigate the auxiliary spillways capacity and its integrity, from a capacity standpoint, Chris talked about the most severe storm predictable, and that storm is is known in the industry as the probable maximum flood. And for this area of the state uh, in Carroll County, it is approximately 39 inches of rain in three days. Um, that's 2.7 times greater than what we call the flood of record at, at Piney Run, which was Hurricane Eloise, 
during Hurricane Eloise, the uh, the water, the reservoir came up almost to the crest of the of that spillway and almost ran through the spillway, but not quite. So we're talking about something that's basically two and a half times greater than that. Um, industry practice and MDU's requirements um, are such that the, the spillway needs to be capable of passing that storm through the spillway without overtopping the dam. And what we've currently found is that that's not the case. Right now, it, the spillway does not have the capacity to do that. So if this extreme storm were to occur, it's likely that the dam would overtop by several feet. So the solution to this is to do a combination of two things, right? uh, widening the spillway and then taking the, the earth that we mine from that spillway when we widen it and raising the dam with it. And so that's what's shown in this graphic here where we would basically widen the spillway um, on the right side of it. And this would be looking downstream, the downstream direction. And then take all of that, all of that soil and put it on top of the dam and, and to maintain the, the slopes, you know, the, so that they look the same as they are now, we would fill the, the downstream side of it. Next slide, please. So for uh, in terms of erodibility of the spillway, we, we did set, we ran several models of the spillway using the uh, information we gathered from the geotechnical investigations, the soil and rock samples we collected. And what we found was that the spillway is built on uh, a combination of soil and highly weathered rock. And so that means that it's, uh, it's got a high potential for erodibility. And uh, so this graphic here shows a failure through spillway erosion uh, for a site in Mississippi um, in 1983. So you can kind of see what, what that would look like. Uh, basically erosion would start on the downstream side of the spillway and then it would work its way back up to the reservoir and eventually the, it, the spillway would cave in and the reservoir would release that way. So the way we, we would deal with this uh, typically is we would use uh, a concrete armoring at the downstream end of the spillway to prevent that erosion from ever happening in the first place. Next slide, please. So as Chris said, MDE's uh, given the county a, uh, a deadline of 2027 to complete the work of, of dealing with the spillway capacity and integrity issues that we, I discussed in the last two slides. And so uh, manifestly the, that's raising the dam and widening the spillway to improve the capacity and then armoring the downstream end of, this, of the auxiliary spillway um, with concrete as I, as I discussed in the last slide. Um, we've, gone through the, the, we've gone through several um, investigations of what these alternatives would cost. Right now, the estimate appears to be about seven and a half million dollars uh, that would cover design, permitting, and construction of the improvements for the dam to address these two issues. And as Chris said, um, you know, the NRCS is, is, would be fully, can, can be fully involved in this. Uh, the grant program that they have that this dam is, is uh, ap that applies to this dam funds 100% of design as well as 65% of construction with the county as the dam owner or the sponsoring local organization picking up the other 35% of construction. So the potential here when you work it out is, is a $5 million NRCS grant to cover a, a good portion of that $7.5 million in cost. Next slide, please. So the other aspect that um, Chris mentioned, uh, the, the, the intent of the dam that was never, never realized or has been realized in its lifetime is the, uh, the use of the dam for water supply. And so since we were looking at everything else, we took another look at, at what it would take to, um, to basically activate it or turn it on, so to speak. Uh, and so the, the issue, the infrastructure itself, the, the intake tower, the pipe, none of that really presents a, a lot of, of any major issue. The major issue that we found was that there's been quite a bit of sedimentation of the reservoir over its uh, almost 50 year lifespan. And so what that's, it, what, that, what, that's uh, what that means is that we've lost about 22% of the reservoir's volume to sedimentation. And so to restore that volume, um, we would have to either remove the sediment or increase the volume of the pool to offset it. Removing the sediment, um, to, to give you an idea of, uh, of the, the volume of sediment we're talking about, we're talking about 725 acre feet. So imagine a football field, 725 feet high, and that's the amount of sediment that, that we estimate based on our surveys that's in the reservoir. Um, Removing that is cost prohibitive. Um, 
tens of millions of dollars, um, way more than, than what the project would otherwise cost. So the other option is we can raise the pool to increase the, um, the volume of water in it, and, and that way we can recapture the volume that we would be able to use for water supply. Um, by raising the pool, which in this case would require about a two and a half foot raise, a little less than two and a half feet, um, we would have to deal with the impacts of doing that. And so the graphic on the right shows what the normal pool, the regular everyday pool would look like in the reservoir after a two and a half foot raise. And you can see there's basically a little bit of incursion onto the waterfront at Piney Run Park. Obviously that runs all the way around the reservoir. So there's, there's impacts all the way around um, to, to various you know, aspects of, of the park. And so in addition to that, we would also have to do, make some additional modifications to the dam, uh, reinforce the, uh, the uh, existing principal spillway riser structure that Chris was talking about, um, since it wasn't designed for a pool that high. Uh, we would also have to, uh, to uh, install a concrete weir structure across that auxiliary spillway. Uh, there would have to be modifications, obviously, to the recreational area, since the pool would be, be higher and encroached more on the shoreline. And to do the work in the, uh, on the riser structure, we would have to likely drain the reservoir because we'd have to excavate around that structure to reinforce it. Next slide, please. So obviously, if we were to go after the, the water supply security end of things, and this would basically just give, give the county another option for water supply, we would be talking about an additional, additional $8 million in design, permitting, and construction costs to make the improvements around the reservoir. Um, and so NRCS would, would share in that cost. Th these are the costs that they would share in. So then the budget would become $15.5 million with NRCS picking up 65% of that or about $10 million. Um, there'd be an additional $5.5 million in county investment that would cover what happens with the water after it's pulled out of the reservoir. So there would have to be a pump station to get it from basically down around Piney Run Creek itself, up out of the valley and to wherever it's gonna go. And that may likely would be uh, over towards the water treatment plant at Liberty. Um, and then there would be recreational uh, infrastructure modifications that NRCS would not share in the cost of. So basically the modifications to the waterfront um, would, would be borne by the county, that cost would be borne by the county. So all told, it's a $21 million capital project with a potential for $10 million of NRCS uh, grant funding. And I think Chris is gonna talk about the uh, kind of a comparison of the alternatives that we are presenting and, uh, and the risks and rewards associated with them. Yeah, thanks Jeff. So um, to, make, um, to make discussion and, and decision-making a little bit easier, what we've done is we've broken out what we feel are three alternatives that we would eventually like you to, to decide upon. So the first alternative, uh, um, I call alternative zero. And this is basically a non-compliance alternative. Um, the benefit to it is that there's, there's a very low cost associated with it. It's uh, reduced cost in county uh, investment and, and so on, because we're basically saying, we're not, gonna, we're not going to abide by what MDE has required. Uh, Obviously, we don't feel that this is a good option to consider. There are a lot of downsides to that option, um, primarily being is that this is a public safety issue. It's a compliance issue. And MDE has the legal authority to make sure that, that this dam gets put into compliance. So if, we decide, if you decided that we're not going to do anything, um, MDE will, will most likely proceed with doing something and we will be out of the decision-making as to what those options would be. And one option that could be considered um, is to remove the hazard, which is to remove the dam, which I don't think anybody is interested in. So um, by virtue of wanting to stay involved in the decisions of what, what is going to happen to the dam, what modifications um, and so on, um, I would not recommend um, alternative zero, but it is, it is an alter alternative for, for discussion. So alternative one is basically compliance only. And this is the seven and a half million dollar uh, investment that Jeff talked about. Uh, the positive to this is that it's the lower investment. It's, uh, it's the minimum investment that the county would make to get into compliance. It addresses the compliance issues. So, so everything would be uh, resolved. 
Um, a key thing to note here is that if we proceed with this alternative, it does not preclude water supply in the future. We're not going down a path that, um, that we can't return from. Um, there's not wasted funding. Um, there, there's no issue with using for implementing water supply in the future if you select this alternative. So, um, another benefit is the NRCS uh, contribution. So approximately $5 million estimated out of the seven and a half. And there's minimum uh, uh, impact to the reservoir during construction. So those are all, all key positives. The only real negative is that if we decide we want to go down the path towards water supply, um, this is our opportunity to get some NRCS funding to help us down that path. And we would, we would miss out on that opportunity if we wanted to delay that, um, the alternative for uh, future water supply. So alternative two is compliance and water supply preparation. So the positives are, again, more potential funding from NRCS. Again, it addresses all the compliance issues. And we basically start down that path towards water supply security. The downside, uh, the risks are that this is a higher investment by the county. I don't want to minimize, and this, this is probably um, the biggest um, non-financial impact, although there is a financial impact. And uh, hopefully you caught it, what Jeff said, is that if we wanted to go down this route, that the construction would most likely require draining the reservoir. So that has a, a lot of uh, implications um, that should, should be considered. Um, one being a potential loss of park revenue. Um, barring a hurricane to fill the reservoir back up, it would probably take more than a year for the reservoir to fill back up once it's drained down. So that's something that needs to be considered. And the last point, I just wanna make sure that everybody is clear on, on the investments and the dollar amounts that we're talking about related to water supply. Think of the water supply implementation as a three-step process. The first step it would be, if we wanna go that down this route, would be the investment in modifications to the dam. That's the $8 million that Jeff mentioned and NRCS would uh, potentially fund portion of that. There is then an additional five and a half million, which Jeff mentioned, which are other things that are on the reservoir property that we feel would make sense that if you're doing a big project, you might as well do them at the same time, right? And, so, and those would not be eligible for NRCS, but they would be a potential expense for the county to, to look at. That's where this range of 15 and a half to $21 million for a, for a project. What that gets you is all the infrastructure on the reservoir site leading towards water supply. There is then an additional investment to get from the reservoir site to the tap. And that is not part of this study. And I've, I've talked with our Department of Public Works and they have estimated, depending on what, um, what option and, and, and final design on how that would happen, that could cost anywhere from an additional 10 to $40 million. So I, I want to make sure that everybody understands that if you select alternative two, that does not get you water to the tap out of Piney Run. That simply takes us down the road towards that. And then there would be future investments from a DPW perspective to get the water to the tap. So those are the three alternatives. Um, from a scheduling perspective, uh, we're pro providing you this for information only today. We're not asking for an action item other than an affirmation that we're going in the right direction. We have scheduled and have publicized a public meeting on March 11th, and that there are two meetings. We'll be holding one in the afternoon and one in the evening so that we can get information from the public as to their thoughts, and we'll be doing the same presentation. Um, we will then be coming back to you in mid-March mid for a request to go to public hearing, and I assume we would then keep the prep, uh, record open for 10 days, and then we would be looking for a decision from you all on which alternative you want to move forward with in early April. From there, then Jeff gets really busy because he has a number of reports that need to be put together and need to be reviewed and approved by NRCS over the next few months. Um, the project deadline uh, or the, the, the schedule for the project is currently to finish that in September, and we're working through whether we can hit that, but that's, that's our, uh, our schedule. Once that report is done, then we would be looking to, uh, the next grant application is due in December, 
where we would be applying to NRCS for uh, grant funding for the design phase of the project, and that's due in December. And then looking, just looking a little bit beyond the schedule, that grant is usually issued in July of the following year, and then we would be looking to bring a firm on to perform design, and, and that's how the project would progress. So with that, I'm um, happy to answer any questions uh, for myself or for Jeff. Yes, uh, Chris, um, you know, we have an agreement, I guess, with Baltimore City on a water and I think that agreement was waters of the Patapsco watershed. It's been years since I, I think, looked into this. Would that have any effect on what you do here for use of this water? Would they be, would we have to pay for it uh, to Baltimore City to use it uh, due to that original agreement or not? Did you want to answer that, Tom, or would you like me to go ahead? No, I certainly can. Uh, two things that we have to understand here. The, the Baltimore City does have control of the waters in the Patapsco and the Gunpowder Falls watersheds in so much as if you want to do anything in those watersheds as far as construction and all, you need to have their approval. The, the county acquired their approval prior to constructing Piney Run Reservoir. So we had their approval to build the, the reservoir and there's really no need to go back to them for anything that, that Chris is proposing here. The other item to keep in mind is that this county did have an appropriation permit from the state of Maryland to withdraw water from Piney Run. So the actual use of water out of Piney Run is controlled through the appropriation process with the state of Maryland. We lost that appropriation due to inactivity, uh, probably uh, might have been five or six years ago, maybe a little longer. So we would have to go back through that process to gain uh, access to using those waters in Piney Run. While Balmer City does not have direct approval of authority over that appropriation, they obviously, through the public process, which that permit would require, could weigh in on it at that point in time. So to answer your question, Commissioner, no, we don't have to go to Balmer City um, directly for, for use of Piney Run, but they could or may participate in any appropriation process that we would have to go through in the future to actually withdraw water out of Piney Run. Mr. Hine, if we want with utilizing the reservoir as a water source, are we looking at, looking at potentially two years between the start of construction and the reservoir being opened back up for the public? Is it less? Is it more? What are we potentially looking at? That's a, that's a hard question to answer because it's dependent on, um, on rainfall because that's how it'll fill back up. So if we have a hurricane, um, sure, it'll fill up pretty quick, um, but just looking at normal stream flow, it could take well over a year um, to fill back up. So that year is in addition to a year of construction? I mean, in total, what are we looking at? How much construction are we looking at? So um, most likely the way it would work is we would drain down the reservoir begin construction right away on, on the parts that need to be accessed. I don't believe, and maybe Jeff has a better feel for, for time frame for that, but you could almost um, close the, the valve and let it start filling up during construction at some point, because it's not gonna fill up super fast. And, and, and so you, you would balance that. And, and if the water started getting too, too deep and you're still in construction, you just open the valve and you drain it back down again. So. It's something that we would try and optimize because everybody wants to get the reservoir filled back up as quickly as possible. But that would be something that would be figured out in detailed design. I appreciate that. Cause I think that's all be a big concern of our constituents for recreation. And it's such a wonderful place to visit. Uh, uh, Mr. Blass, I appreciate you mentioned the uh, Eloise hurricane in 75. I was a child by the Tapsco river when that took place, but more importantly, is in 72 as a small child. I remember Agnes, and Agnes was twice as big as Eloise, if not more. And for you to state that in 75, Eloise almost crested the auxiliary spillway, it guarantees that Agnes would have crested that spillway. And my big concern is that spillway is earthen. And the example you showed of that other dam failing is precisely what probably would happen to Air Dam 
if another hurricane hit the size of Agnes, and that was, what, 49 years ago? And in mm -hmm. a cycle of hurricanes, we're due for one probably within the next 25 years of that same size. So I think it's imperative that we address this issue while we can. And I am of the mind that we should try to capitalize on, at the present time, as much money we can get from other sources to upgrade this reservoir to what it truly was originally designed to be, and that's a water source. And that would give us some independence from buying water from Baltimore City because we surrendered our water rights over to Baltimore City, which makes us dependent on Baltimore City for a water supply. And I'm a very strong advocate of Carroll County having water independence from Baltimore City. And any amount of water we could potentially tap into from Piney Run to offset what we're paying Baltimore City, I am 100% for. Okay, all any valid, other? Yeah, all valid points. Yeah, uh, um, yeah, go ahead. Has there ever been a study done about the, the, the um, length of, 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 what do you call it? The, the length of liberty, the, the service, the length of liberty service at that I mean, years out, are, has, there, has anyone looked to see, based on Baltimore City and, and the county draws from that too, mm -hmm. um, you know, what is the potential there that that could be a serious issue years out as far as the supply goes versus demand? You're talking about, liber you about Liberty Reservoir? Yeah, right, Liberty, right Liberty Reservoir, right. I mean, that would... To me, that would be a, 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 a thought pattern as to whether or not we should even pursue alternative well, two. I, I think I think it's more on in line, and I apologize, didn't want to interrupt, but more in line with what Commissioner Boucher is saying is is taking away our de, our de dependence on Baltimore City and Liberty Reservoir, right. and using Piney as what it was exactly what uh, the commissioner said designed to do and that was to be a reservoir so it's a balance between the community losing a recreational facility for a finite time period to establishing a water source for a much much greater period of time mm -hmm. now this is for information only and because i'm in absolute agreement with uh, where, where you were going with that uh eric um this is for information only uh Today, it's to build this discussion. We will have a couple public meetings. I attended the last one in February, um, and then uh, we'll we'll go from there. But uh, yeah, Eric, very valid points. Um, the community will be concerned and frustrated if we take away a recreational facility. But the the fact is, our role, I believe, is to lead this county uh, and its budget and resources. And this is a resource that has not been tapped into. It's kind of frustrating to me that this sediment built up over so many years and wasn't cared for if we recognize this as a reservoir. Uh, so obviously it wasn't recognized as a reservoir, but now it's time to do what it's designed to be done. So that's, okay, I'm done pontificating on this, um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, Yes, Commissioner. If, 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 yeah. I'm Go sorry, ahead. if I may point out that um, we've used the term security, water security throughout this presentation. And I just want to point that um, part of the reason that we're looking to bring uh, the reservoir online is for redundancy and security and water supply. So yes, we, we do purchase water from Baltimore City, but that is a sole source. And um, a system should have redundancy in it. And so this would be a, a secondary source for water if some something were to happen out of our control that uh, we no longer have that access to uh, for, for drought reasons or whichever, this is another source, another uh, uh, redundant source for water supply for the area. I mean, to think Baltimore City has a monopoly on the water you know, supply for Carroll County you know, uh, I won't say it's crazy, but it's uh, it's obviously to their advantage and not necessarily to ours. So, um, uh, you know, we have, um, you know, uh, former commissioners out of vision of water security in Carroll County with these three reservoirs to be constructed. Uh, Carroll County would be in 
control of its own water uh, with Piney Run with the only one that was actually constructed. But I, I agree, we need to start moving uh, forward on this to uh, secure water for the future. I think we need to secure land for the future for food, same way. Uh, we need those security measures uh, as leaders in the county. I think it's our obligation to start looking at the big picture. And don't forget the original, and maybe Chris, going back, give us a briefing on what was the original uh, intent and how was this plan to move forward uh, when they started purchasing, when we purchased all the ground for these reservoirs. But this one is, I think, one we have to start on and keep moving forward uh, with. So. Uh, I'm totally in agreement with what Eric and uh, Ed are saying here. I, I'll reiterate, uh, we're, this dam brings up two major public safety issues for us. One is the potential loss of life downriver or downstream, whatever it may be called. And the second is providing a quality water supply to our citizens. I mean, water and sewer are two of the most basic fundamental things we as county commissioners need to supply our community with or any civilization's responsibility of its civic leader. So I'm all about that. And Ed mentioned something about the, uh, the sediment. Now that brings up the issue, raising the water level, will that in any way impact private property? What as it goes up in the floodplain? Does, does the increase in water level do anything to the private property that might adjacent the reservoir? Because I know on the north end, it's the, it's lower, there's a floodplain. So yeah, there are, um, and Tom, re refresh my memory, there's a, a term for it, um, uh, a type of easement that's on a lot of the properties around uh, the reservoir. So a full, a full mm -hmm. analysis of what kind of impacts there would be um, would need to be done, and that would be part of the, the process for, for looking at the design of this. But Tom, what's the name of that rest of that easement? Yeah, there's actually flowage easements, what are called flowage easements that have been recorded on private property, which allows for the water backing up in Piney Run during large storm events. And then I think there's actually an extra buffer added on. So there are there are existing flowage easements, mostly on the up, like you said, Commissioner, on the upgraded side of Piney Run, because most the land all around Piney Run, you know, is controlled by the county. We wouldn't run into any potential legal entang entanglement, so to speak, if the water level raised. Uh, you know, I, I'm worried that potentially a neighboring property could try to sue or put an injunction on us to tie things up. So you're saying there's easement, so we'd be okay and we wouldn't have to worry about that? I'm saying there's there's easements in place now. They would have to be evaluated fully to make sure your issue is not, not going to be a, a, an issue. Uh, but again, maybe or Chris or Jeff could address this too. You know, a rise of two and a half feet, while while it sounds like a lot, as Piney Run, we're we're raising it at the top end. So the actual you know impacts to that um, from a from an extent standpoint are not are not huge. I guess is what I'm saying uh, because we're at the we're at the largest portion of the of the reservoir there. So again, between the flow easements and and you know basically a two and a half foot rise, not being a super significant rise. Uh, I don't I don't think the county will have problems in the future, but all that has to be evaluated as part of the process that, that Jeff's gonna have to take forward after you all make your decisions. Thank you. G gentlemen, I think, uh, again, you met your intent uh, and that was to provide us the briefing, but also get us uh, thinking through the three options or course of action or I can't remember what you call them, Chris. Um, alternatives, I think you said. Uh, yeah. Looking forward to uh, hearing from the what the public has to say after uh, March 11th, and then you coming back to us for further discussion. Um, so, good stuff. I really appreciate your time. Appreciate your time, uh, AECOM, in uh, doing the work that you're doing. So, very thorough. Any, Thank you very much, Commissioners. Any further comments on this? I just want to state, gentlemen, I think that was an excellent briefing. And if this does go through, both Commissioner Rothstein and I, we fished that reservoir, so it's all impact us as well. We're all all feel the pain of losing that as recreation for a few years, but hopefully it'd be a good long-term investment. If uh, if I could just add uh, two more points. Uh, we are, from a Bureau of, of Utility standpoint, we are working on some redundancies now with bringing some wells online, which could 
provide us up to a quarter of what our daily uh, supply is from Liberty. And we're also starting next week working with the city of Baltimore in negotiations on our, our particular rates that we pay now. So just wanted to make you aware of that because that will be a part of your uh, future conversations. Thanks, Jason, coming in and, and sharing that with us. So, okay, gentlemen, thank you. Now let's move thank on you. to Slattenberg. Uh, we're gonna talk about fees, dealing with water and sewer, just as what Commissioner Boucher was sharing, and then also annexation requests and fees associated with both. So, Linda. All right, good morning, commissioners. So today I have with me Price Wagner, who is the planner in our department and handles the water and sewer amendments and the triennial update. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with you and give you a brief presentation. On January 28th, we came before the board requesting your permission to move forward and, oops, sorry, wrong screen. Um, uh, if you can reshare that, please. I'm not sure what happened there. Still presenter. Yeah. Okay, there you go. Much better. Um, we came before you requesting your permission to move forward and investigating fees for water and sewer and annexations. So I'm going to go ahead and present these in uh, two different presentations. The first for discussion are fees associated with water and sewer. So again, uh, just a quick overview that the Water and Sewer Master Plan implements as and is consistent with County Master Plan, Municipal and Community Comprehensive Plans. Um, this is a coordinated effort with the municipalities. We put this forward not only for the County Water and Sewer System, as we just heard a discussion on the Piney Run Reservoir that's controlled by Carroll County, but also the municipalities as well. Um, and these are based on the evaluation of facility usage, the needs for upgrade or expansion, public health, plan growth patterns. So this is what we do and how we set the priorities working with the municipalities. Uh, this is required by the health and environmental article of the annotated code, and it requires Carroll County to review and adopt this every three years. And that's what we refer to as the triennial update. But in between the triennial update, we also do amendments. And we have a cycle of a twice a year amendment. Um, we'll process a spring cycle if there's a reason to, and a fall cycle. In addition to special amendments, and a special amendment comes about when we're not in a cycle and there needs to be some type of amendment done for an emergency reason um, or special project for the municipalities or the county. And the water and sewer master plan, even though you, the county commissioners, hold a public hearing and you adopt these plans and these amendments, these are not official until Maryland Department of the Environment approves any of the changes or the triennial update. So just a little bit of information. Um, over the past five years, we've processed eight amendments. So not quite two amendments a year, including one special summer amendment in 2017 that needed to be completed. A total of 35 properties, including two full town revisions, not part of the triennial update, have been done over the past five years. So it's been quite a lot of work. So what I'm gonna to show to you is just the general process. These slides have a lot of information. I'm not gonna go over the information, but I just wanna share with you, just so you can see what details are and what really goes into this process for county staff. So staff processes amendments, as I said earlier, for all eight municipalities and submits them to N MDE for approval. And we work with MDE and the towns or public works throughout this process until the submittal is finalized and we get word back from Maryland Department of the Environment. So one of the biggest roles that we play is really that coordination with the local jurisdiction, whether it be the town or the county and um, Maryland Department of the Environment. A lot of times Price works with MDE throughout the process to make sure that what is being submitted um, is acceptable to them. So we don't get down the road of processing the triennial update or an amendment that MDE won't approve. So we make sure all the kinks are worked out prior to even the submittal of the plan itself. And at a minimum, there are seven just broad based general steps. But within each of those seven steps, there's a ton of detail that needs to be completed. 
And so again, I'm not gonna go through all of this, but as you can see, just by the amount of words on this page, a lot of detail in the steps. So these are just the first four steps of us interagency coordination, coordination with MDE, municipal planning commission coordination, if it goes to um, if it's coming from a municipality, um, as well as making sure consistency with all of the plans and processes that we have to make sure it's consistent with. You're scheduling a public hearing with you all, even though we might be processing an amendment for a town, the Board of County Commissioners has to host a public hearing. There's very discrete steps that we must take in order to have an official public hearing. After you conduct a public hearing, you have to have a deliberation and discuss the changes that are being requested of you and that have to be put into the plan. And then finally, um, making sure it goes to MDE for approval to make it official. Again, this approval with MDE has been happening throughout steps one through six. When we get to MDE, all of this work, we know what the outcome is going to be because ultimately we need the approval of MDE to move forward with any of the changes. So that brings us to the cost and why we're asking for a fee uh, to be incurred as part of the amendment process, not the triennial update. The triennial update is something that we do as part of Comar, something that we have to do every three years. It benefits us and the, and the local jurisdictions within Carroll County. So that we would recommend no fee obviously be done for that. But the amendment cycle is where it takes up a lot of staff time. They happen quite frequently. Um, sometimes they have to be done very quickly because it's an emergency for a particular municipality that needs to have a development go through, um, or there's some type of necessity where a constituent that may be on the boundary of, mun of the municipality needs twofold. They need to be annexed in because for some reason they need to be on water and or sewer. And the towns have it in their codes that they will not supply water or sewer if you're not in the corporate limit. So a lot of this goes hand in hand with annexations. So as you can see, we broke down um, average staff time for each of the discrete um, issues that we have to, to do working through a water and sewer amendment. So on average, it's 31 hours per amendment. Now this can fluctuate depending on how many towns come in at an amendment. When we process us in a spring or a fall amendment, we're not doing it for one town. Sometimes it can be all the towns could come forward. Sometimes it could be one town with a quarter acre property. Really, it does not fluctuate in how many um, acreage or properties or towns come in. That's just a variable we can't control. So we've averaged about 31 hours is what Price came up with on average for his time that he feels that he spends working through all of the process. Um, so staff time cost recovery estimate, we've averaged at about $775 just in those terms. Again, that could fluctuate greatly depending. Um, this is probably more on the low end if we're only doing one or two properties, but if we're multiple properties and multiple town coordination, multiple town planning commissions, this could be a lot longer in time. And then we actually have a fixed cost. Um, again, that's out of our control, depending on what the Carroll County Times charges, but we have to pay $452.53 every time we post a hearing ad into the Carroll County Times, which we're required to do by law. So at just a very basic cost direct to the county, it's about $1,228 per amendment that we process for the county and for the municipalities. So what we would like you all to consider, and again, this is just a briefing, we can come back for more discussion at a future date, is that a fee be collected at the time of submittal of an application. We do have an application posted on our website for water and sewer amendments. We have a process for them to fill out so either by the municipality or the applicant. Um, and once, as we do with our rezonings or annexations, once a complete application packet is accepted, then we will collect the fee at that time. A lot of times we have incomplete submittals, so we would make sure everything was together and we could actually process an amendment before we would collect a fee. Um, and then just to throw out there, you know, a consideration that we incorporate a hardship waiver when necessary. 
Um, and some examples of this would be an annexation because of a water and sewer service uh, is necessary for a single residential parcel that has no additional development potential. This could be because they have failing systems and they have no reserve area. They're on the corporate limit where they can be annexed in to a municipality and receive those services. Sometimes MDE requires the town to do that annexation and make them come into the system for these various reasons. And this can be determined on a case by case basis. So a suggested fee that staff is proposing is a 50% cost recovery uh, for the two amendments that we process for a spring amendment or fall amendment of $400 plus a 50% cost recovery of the public hearing ad. So why I suggest that is because there could be multiple properties from multiple towns coming in. And so it would not be right in my mind to charge them for the full public hearing ad when there could be multiple. Sometimes it could just be one, but sometimes it can be multiples coming through. But a special amendment is different. That is something that we do unique that comes in just for that particular property, for that particular town or the county. So we would ask them to bear the full brunt of the cost for the public hearing ad. Um, based on you know, the discussion today, some of the next steps for us would be to uh, memorialize this within the county town agreements that are signed annually and to work with the municipalities on this fee structure and how to move forward. So are there any questions regarding this aspect of the fee for water and sewer? Well, Ms. Eisenberg, I, I commend you on doing that cost analysis. That's speaking my language and business. I love seeing staff do that, breaking down what our costs and expenses are. It would it be a hypothetical, say a developer wants to get annexed into Union Bridge, would they be the ones paying this fee and not the town, if I understand correctly? I mean, I think that, that, that we can approach it that way. It would have to be on a case by case basis. Um, and, and we can see either we can pass the cost on to the applicant or to the town or the town when they, um, if it's an annexation, that's something different. So if they're being annexed and then they have to go on to water and sewer, it just depends on where they are. Sometimes that property is already identified as existing or priority. So there would be no change to the water and sewer plan. That would just be the annexation process itself. This will come into play if they're not in a planned service area or there needs to be some change within the service area to incorporate um, either a single property or multiple properties. And, and that is something that we can work out with the towns to what they feel would be the most reasonable way to um, apply that fee, whether they would want us to have it go directly to the applicant and the applicant come to us or pass through the town. Thank you for clarification. Linda, you're asking that there's no, you're, you're, you're sharing with us that there's no action necessary. However, you next steps plan on incorporating it into the county town agreements and informing the municipalities. So you're sharing with us that this is already a established, um, you know, a number that you will be putting into the uh, towns uh, or do you need our concurrence? Uh, we, I would want your concurrence. I was just telling you what some of the next steps could be to how we would move forward with this. Um, and if you wanna come back for any discussion, this is the first time you're hearing this. So I, would be happy to come back and maybe reach out to the towns. I didn't want to presume that we were going in this direction prior to speaking with you today, but going talking to the towns directly and asking them about their thoughts and how um, we could manage moving this forward. Okay, get, that's the staff, staffing and getting their thoughts is, is one thing. Incorporating it into agreements is a couple steps, I think, down the road uh, that we want to make sure we're very clear with as commissioners and the leadership of the municipalities. Um, but, but the staffing, I mean, yeah, getting their, their thoughts and understanding and ideas uh, will definitely help us make decisions. Um, and anything else? Nope. Hearing none. Okay. Yeah. I think so. I, yeah. 
Yeah, I, one second, Linda. I apologize. No, I think just yeah. we need time to think in. That's all. Yeah. I see what because this has the potential to to uh, affect yeah our town town county agreements as well. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, and also dissuade people from doing things. Well, right. Um, so yeah, you know, I, I I think one idea, and uh, you know, next time just getting us these slides ahead of time, kind of to build the discussion. It's, this is a lot of valuable information. Um, I think we just need to be a little bit more, well, we will be more prepared when we make a decision. The intent here is not to make a decision. Right. So, okay, okay. Um, yeah, anything for anybody else? Linda? Um, so if you're agreeable, then we will move forward and discuss with the towns the possibility of moving in this direction of doing a cost recovery for water and sewer and speak with them and get their thoughts and see how, um, if it becomes implemented, how we would implement that with them. Doing the appropriate staffing is what, you know, I think we all would expect. Uh, making the decisions would be coming back to us with the feedback from the municipalities and saying, okay, we're ready to make a decision. So let's put it in front of us. But we no, okay. As long as we're no, saying the is, same thing, we're good. <laughs> yes, we are. I just, I just wanted to make sure that you are okay with us moving forward of just talking with the staff at the towns. Sure. Absolutely. You, you, I'm, my expectations is that you're talking to, to uh, the towns and municipalities all the time, uh, staff to staff. So, yeah, okay. What else? Anything else for the good of the group? Or are we ready to move on? So that was it for that particular topic. The next would be the annexations. Okay, yeah. go ahead. So again, this is similar to the discussion that we just had on water and sewer. Um, again, this was a discussion that we had as an introduction to move forward on January 28th for your direction. So again, I've, I have Claire Stewart with me here today who processes our annexations. And so wanted to just kind of run down a similar presentation with you regarding those. So again, just a brief overview that an annexation is the process obviously of legally including the uh, property into the corporate lim limits of a city um, or a town from an area that is unincorporated outside of the municipality. Annexations must occur under Maryland law within the municipal growth area. And this growth area has been jointly established by the county and the municipality. And there's two types of annexations, petition and resolution. So annexations are petitioned by an applicant, not by the town or the county. We don't ask that the properties go into the municipality and the municipalities typically do not bring properties in. If they do, then it must be done by a resolution by the town. And they must have two thirds of the properties within that annexable area agreeable to the annexation. So they just can't say you're you and you are coming in. That's not how it works. Um, the municipality processes the annexation request and submits it to us, the county. And our main role, just as with water and sewer, is to help um, organize comments, get it out to the applicable agencies for review, and from time to time when necessary, work with you, I, obviously you've seen these come through, is to get a zoning waiver from the Board of County Commissioners. So over the last five years, we've processed 20, 20 applications for annexation. Um, annexations that were actually incorporated into the towns were only 16. So, and those have been really the last seven or eight, only four have gone, um, have not been approved within that five, in those five years for various reasons. Um, annexation petitions came in and the towns have chosen not to bring those properties for whatever reason into um, the annexed area. Uh, we've had Sykesville, I believe, and Claire can clarify more. Um, Sykesville's had a few, Hampstead, um, where they have not brought those properties into the corporate limits, even after the annexation process has moved forward. And 185 acres of county land has been incorporated into the municipalities over that time. And zoning waivers, the last few, so we've had six zoning waivers come through as well. 
So staff processes these annexation submittals following MML, municipal, Maryland Municipal League guidelines. And again, these review um, ensures a complete annexation packet is prepared. Many times we uh, find in these annexation packets that there's information missing. So Claire works very closely with the town and the applicant to make sure that we have full submission. Um, and then we wrap the annexation for comments to the applicable agencies. So we uh, review them and wrap them through the county agencies as well as state submittal. So there's a minimum of 18 steps that are required um, under the MML process, and this does not include when a zoning waiver is required. And as I said, a zoning waiver is necessary if the annexation area is going to be um, more than 50% uh, of a higher density or intensity of the from the current use to the new use. So an example would be going from residential to commercial, commercial to industrial, or a lower density residential zoning category to a more intense zoning district. Again, I'm not gonna go through all the details, but you can see these are a list of discrete steps that we follow um, for each annexation. Again, I mean, this is like two pages of different things that we must do. Some of it is more detailed than others. Some of it is checking off the box, but it's still a lot of work to make sure that this process is scored um, accurately and correctly. And this is the a schematic from MML um, that we've created to show you how many, there's six general steps with all these sub steps in between that we must follow in order to again, make sure an accurate package is being put forward. I, so think, I, for my, I think I speak for my colleagues when I say, we're very glad that we have a professional staff to handle this because there's no way I could comprehend all this. <laughs> So it may seem that we're just pushing paper or doing something that seems very easy and nominal, but it really truly is not. That's why I wanted to show you these slides, that there's a lot of detail um, that go into this process, and the devil's always in the details and making sure they're accurate and correct. So again, uh, we did a detailed time estimate for annexation, and in general, it takes about 35 and a half hours of staff time per annexation, to move this through the process. So typical uh, cost recovery for staff is about $1,000. Um, if we have to do a zoning waiver, that takes a little more time and additional steps to the process that would require um, changes uh, to the process. So we would estimate another $375 if a zoning waiver is requested. Um, and then even after the annexation is complete, we still have to work with um, authorizing map changes with land and resource management, um, as well as making sure things are filed properly with uh, land records in the county. Um, and municipalities actually do charge annexation fees when they process annexations for their municipality. So this is what happens within Carroll County. These are the Carroll County municipalities and what they charge. So. If you are going into the town of Hampstead, you pay a flat fee of $700 uh, for them to process the request for you. Manchester has no filing fee, but you must pay the legal fees that are involved um, with their town attorney and any advertising fees. So depending on how long and how in-depth an annexation is, they'll send you a bill. Mount Airy charges a flat fee of $5,000 to cover those costs. New Windsor does not charge anything. The town of Sykesville charges a flat fee of $500 for an annexation. Tawny Town and Union Bridge are similar to Manchester where you pay no filing fee, but the applicant must pay for the advertising because they do a public hearing. We are not responsible for a public hearing on our end they do a public hearing when it goes to the town council. Um, you have to pay a, their attorney's fees, consulting fees, and any other fee that may come out of the annexation as it progresses through the town system. So again, they'll send you a bill for that and it's based on case by case. Westminster, depending on the size and depth of the annexation, they charge between 2,500 to $5,000 to process an annexation. So again, just as we discussed with the water and sewer, that we would look to have a fee collected at the time of submittal by the municipality or applicant when a complete package is accepted by the county. 
Um, again, we can incorporate a hardship waiver when necessary, and this can be determined on a case-by-case -case basis. So again, a suggested uh, cost recovery would be half, 50% cost recovery. Um, and this is in line with what uh, Sykesville charges. So we would be no more than the lowest cost for the municipality of $500, which happens to be what we consider a 50% cost recovery of staff time. We have no direct outline of expenses. We don't have to hold a public hearing, so we don't have to pay for an advertising. Again, that's on the town's end. Um, so with that, a zoning waiver, $500 would be that amount. And with the zoning waiver, uh, $750 would be 50% cost recovery of staff time. And again, just as I said before, some ways that we can have some next steps would be definitely to discuss with the municipalities and possible incorporation if you choose to move in this direction to incorporate into the county town agreements. And that's all I have for you. Thanks. And I think uh, similar to the last, you know, getting the uh, appropriate staffing with the municipalities, uh, getting their insight and thoughts, coming back, sharing it with us, allowing us to then make a decision on incorporating uh, fees and then also, um, you know, putting them into the county and town agreements. Uh, any thoughts, comments? Very good briefings, very uh, obviously very detailed in information. Commissioner Boucher? Director Eisenberg, I really appreciate you breaking down the methodology. This makes it easier for us as commissioners to not only sell it, but also defend it. Because so often the ambiguity is where we get in trouble. So breaking all this down is very uh, sellable and defensible. So we, we very much appreciate your effort and your staff. So thank you. Okay. And Ms. Claire, you're the strong silent type I see. So I think uh, we're good to go unless there's anything. Okay, let's, let's move on. All right, thank you, commissioners. Thank you very much. Yep, thank you. Um, Open admin, do we have, before we go into open admin, do we have any public comments? Yes, sir, I believe we have a few here. We've got three callers, I'm gonna call off one at a time. Okay. First one is caller one, if you wanna go over the guidelines. Okay, before we go into uh, public uh, comments, again, it is three minutes, uh, and it is not a buildup of three minutes. If you would like to talk, that's great. If you'd like to defer, whoever's being deferred to, still only has those three minutes and we're gonna be in a hard stop at three minutes each. Uh, it's also not to build dialogue uh, between the caller and us. Uh, the intent is to be um, uh, ability to gather the information and respond appropriately uh, at a later time. So with that, you got okay, the- Okay, uh, let's no. get our first caller. First caller, you're unmuted. First caller, you are unmuted. Give you a chance to get to that unmute button. It always reminds me of the Phil Donahue show, where he would say, the caller, is that the caller two I'm speaking? <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're gonna move to caller two. I haven't heard that in a long time. The caller two, it's your opportunity to make a public comment. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Rob Carberry, um, part of the Neighbors of Sunshine Way. On February 11th, we um, read a statement to you all, a uh, public statement, and we then presented that at your office, and we were curious if you have had any response for us or what we're supposed to do next. Okay, again, again, sir, the, the intent here is to get your comments, but not to build the dialogue. We will uh, respond appropriately um you know at a, at a later time but the, the, this is not to build the dialogue so okay well just to while my time is going then just keep in mind that um we really do take this very seriously and we're looking for your support in this and um we hope to hear back from somebody soon yes sir okay thank you thank you caller number three you're on yes, hi. Uh, uh, hi, uh, my name is Michael Wiener. I'm also on Sunshine Way, uh, 589. Um, back on February 11th, uh, again, uh, our community spoke. 
um, we were given the impression that there would be a response within a week. Uh, you can listen and go back and watch the, uh, the recording of the uh, meeting. Uh, it's been two weeks given the weather event that took place. So um, not having a response today and not being recognized uh, in advance um, is a little concerning, um, given this is a safety issue. Um, we uh, brought forth plenty of um, evidence of community support. Um, it was mentioned earlier today that uh, the commissioners have a, a, are committed to the community, so we would like to see uh, the, uh, the evidence of that with regards to our situation. And um, since we don't have a time frame, we were under the impression we would be getting a response today. Uh, we were, we will be taking this to the, to the rest of the community and the public by uh, our many means we can um, to let everybody know what's going on. Uh, this is not uh, something that we should have to wait this long to have address. Uh, we've been trying to work with the county for years and it just stays, it delays and delays. And just again, right today, the lack of um, response shows where, where it sits on the priority list of, um, of the commissioners. At least that's a concern of mine. And I hope that um, you commissioners can um, look at what we presented to you all and um, back your uh, constituents and provide us uh, what we're looking for. Uh, this isn't, uh, this cannot keep going on. This has to be addressed. Uh, so, you know, please, we will be back next week expecting to be on the agenda, expecting there to be a conversation about this. If there is something that we have to do to formally get on the agenda, then please, um, Commissioner Fraser has my contact information. Let me know whatever that is. But uh, we just can't sit back and keep waiting and waiting. Uh, we need to have this addressed as soon as possible. Thank you. Hey, thank you, sir. Did we get caller one back? I believe we have caller six here. Okay. Caller six, you're unmuted. Yes, thank you. Hi, my name is Aaron Docker. I'm also um, one of the residents on Sunshine Way at 565. Um, again, we're part of the meeting uh, conference last uh, two weeks ago, rather. And as uh, the gentleman was reading the letter uh, from that just spoke, Mark Weiner, you know, I could I could sit there and see the, the reactions on some of the faces of of, of select commissioners and. In, in my mind, it was, it was a bit uh, demeaning to show lack of sincerity and just lack of care. Um, then again, I could be reading that wrong. Hopefully I am. And as y'all stated earlier, that um, y'all do care about your community. You do work for your community. And, and we, are, we are your community, you know, along with, with the rest of Carroll County. Um, the... The situation we have on this on, on our road is, I understand, not looked at as severely as it's seen by us, the, the residents of the neighborhood. But with, with our kids going out, you know, even in this weather, doing snowmen and sledding and and finding their friends out in the neighborhood and whatnot, the roads being in, even in worse conditions is what they normally are on a regular dry day. Um, the, the speed does not. It, there, there's nothing that deters it. It does not seem that anything that the speed limit signs or anything of the, of the sort. Um, now I do understand that if we're going to have a law in place, we have to have someone to enforce that law. So the speed limit is 25. We have no one to enforce that. It's 25. Then who's to say what, why is there a speed limit? Um, with the stop signs that we, we, we are, are almost begging for, um, at least, if it stops one car, that may be the car that would cause an accident or take one of our kids from us or cause damage to the property of, of, of an innocent home. Um, I'm even so far as to incline to, to pay and I, I will, I will pledge to, you know, pay for two stop signs, my, uh, to be 
put into the ground and, and put up. Um, if it's a matter of money from the county side of things, um, I don't know if any of my other neighbors would be willing to do that, but um, I, I'm willing myself to finance it. I would talk with my wife, and we're going to go with that. And I think I may have a few other neighbors in the neighborhood that would be willing to help out as well. If not, it would be a slow process, but we'd take care of it. Um, look forward to hearing back uh, from you all about this matter. I uh, look forward to being on the agenda where we can actually have a discussion. Uh, neighborhood can come together with the spokesperson and deal with it that way. Uh, again, commissioners, thank you for your time and thank you for all you do. Yes, sir. Thank you. Or do we have any others? <clears throat> Excuse me. That's all the callers. Okay. Okay. So public comment is done. Uh, for open admin, we have closed minutes from February 23rd that need to be uh, looked at and approved. Motion to approve the. Go ahead, Commissioner Weaver. I move to approve. Uh, okay, second. <laughs> okay, we have a motion. I think we have a second. All in favor for approving those minutes? Aye. Aye. Okay, we got 5 0. And open admin. Does anybody have anything for open admin this afternoon? 1330 or 130, we will be having a solid waste work session discussion or work solid waste discussion work session, uh, which will also be open. We will be going into closed at 12 p.m. Well, no, we won't. We'll be going into closed <laughs> as soon as we're done with this. Uh, okay. For agendas. <clears throat> oh, can I, yes. just, oh, I yes, can do it please. after agendas or before. I just have one quick thing. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, um, the city of Westminster has asked the commissioners for their um, support in a grant that they are going after for um, the Maryland Heritage Areas Authority. Um, they're seeking funding to rehab the William Durbin House, which I understand is on Wakefield Valley. I um, would assume that we would be in support of their, their grant application. I believe so. Yes, yeah, sure. Yeah, that where where is that? You know, down that's on uh, Wakefield Wait, Valley. On the, right. When the, the oh, is that the old uh, the old building? The, the old building, seventeen okay, something it. or another. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Now, Ro yeah. Roberta, um, Sykesville Main Street. Did you see that they were going after a grant? By chance? And if not, we'll talk yeah, about it later. Great. I could I could call um, their town manager and ask them if they would like our support. <laughs> But they haven't okay. asked them. Okay. Okay. I'll do that. So starting next week, it will be March, March first. Uh, we oh, I I will be attending um, a ribbon cutting down to Eldersburg, the Marathon Technology Solutions uh, on Progress Way. On Tuesday, uh, we will have a open session starting at uh, 10 a.m. Mike Fowler will start with legislative uh, update. What's going on down in Annapolis? We will be talking about uh, turf mowing around the county buildings and parks. We'll be looking for a bid approval on the Carolyn Manor pipe lining. Uh, we will have a stormwater review position discussed by Mr. Devilbiss and Mr. Hine. Uh, there will be a request to approve for a grant submission uh, for the FY22 Maryland Heritage Area Grant Program. And then on Wednesday uh, is the MACO, the Maryland Association Counties, uh, line up with the Land Use Subcommittee with Commissioner Frazier. You can take, uh, Tax I'll, I'll stop you. You can take yeah. all that off of there. Uh, MACO okay. will not be meeting now until March the something. Uh, at, least, at least next two yeah, weeks. Okay. The next two okay. weeks. They, you can remove MACO over the next two weeks. Okay. Um, so at starting at 2 p.m., 1400, there will be an opioid Senior policy group meeting, Commissioner Frazier will be attending. Commissioner Weaver will be attending the Carroll County Board of Education FY22 operation budget hearing and work session. And Commissioner Wentz will be attending the evening planning commission work session. On Thursday, we have open sessions starting at 9 a.m. Um, we'll be talking about COVID. We'll be getting an update from uh, Mr. Singer. 
We'll also be having another discussion uh, with Mr. McCoy dealing with fire EMS, in a fire EMS department update. Uh, we will also uh, be following up with a discussion on the SAFER grant uh, with Mr. McCoy and Mr. Zaleski. Um, we will have a FAA Airport Coronavirus Response Grant Program Award. We will uh, go over the priority letter, the uh, County Transportation Priority Letter uh, for 2022. <clears throat> Excuse me. We will then have a discussion from Mr. Lyburn, our economic developer on the Harrison Lyshire property uh, that later that morning. Friday, March 5th, we have nothing. The 6th, we have nothing. On the 7th, uh, Commissioner Boucher. On Sunday, we'll have the podcast, which means that Commissioner Frazier has a podcast on the week before. <laughs> Whatever that is. <clears throat> March 8th. This week. Huh? That, that it's already done? Yeah. Oh, this okay. week. <laughs> I just, just is it? turned yeah, it in on Monday. I turned it in on Monday. Oh. It'll be it'll be, it'll be, aired it'll be brought on this Sunday. Sunday. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Don't mess me up there, man. March 8th, <laughs> Transit Advisory Council, Commissioner Frazier will be attending at 3 p.m. Tuesday, we will have open session starting at 10 with a budget overview from Mr. Zaleski at 7 p.m. on the 9th. Uh, we have an Ag Center board meeting that I will be attending. There will be no MAKO on the 10th. On the 1 p.m., uh, 310 tempering ribbon cutting is scheduled to happen in Westminster with Commissioner Frazier, and I also will be attending if that actually happens. There's a little tentative situation with that, but we'll talk about that. Uh, I, I know Mr. Lyburn is working that action. Right. There's a Governor's Workforce Development Board meeting. I will be attending at 3.30 that afternoon on the uh, 10th. And then at 5 p.m., Carroll County Board of Education Board meeting, Commissioner Weaver is scheduled to attend. On Thursday, we will have a 9 a.m. Yeah, Thursday, March 11th, 9 a.m. Uh, open session with uh, talking about the state, talking about mis with Mr. Singer about what's going on from the health department. We'll get a legislative update from Mr. Fowler and also an update on fire EMS from Director McCoy. We'll then have a community needs assessment survey report uh, on partnership for a healthier Carroll County provided by Ms. Dorothy Fox, our, the executive director of the partnership for a healthier Carroll County. We will, uh, There'll be a request for approval for FY22 submission office of the problem solving courts grant by Judge Hecker and Mr. Zaleski will be in attendance for that. We'll then go into open admin, nothing on Friday the 12th, nothing on the 13th, and I will have the podcast on 314 Pi Day on Sunday. Anything else for the good of the group? I need a motion to go into recess, uh, or don't I? Or should I go into a, go. Should I adjourn and then go into closed, or what, Roberta? Just, just um, adjourn um, or recess until one. Well, you could do it either way. I guess recess until one. Okay, let's uh, recess and open back up at one thirty. Open session. Motion to recess until one thirty. <laughs> so I got a second. Um, I'll second, second. the mall. I'm over at the mall now, as you I'll can see. Yeah. <laughs> First, I'm in the hot chair. Now I'm over at okay. the mall. Okay. All in favor, give me a thumbs up. Aye. And we're going to be going to close.